Oh, upfronts are this week. Yeah, but I'm way behind. I'm yeah, sorry. Are you? I was all ready to go, and then I was like, then I looked at my, I actually looked at my calendar, and I went, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it'll be a, it'll be bad if it happens. So. Yeah, but how it, it's got to be weird to not be at upfronts though. If you're the you're the creator and the showrunner. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> uh, They're going to give you a pass on that one. Yeah, they uh, they. I don't think they expected me to go. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's uh, you know it's more about other shows that are premiering right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know they invite everybody, and but my cast is going or my main cast is going to go. So right, and Elgin, the guy I'm doing the project right. with, is going to go. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. he's not been to, so it's all you know. Yeah, it's new for him, right? This is his. Fir- is this a, he's written other stuff, but this is his first like big TV show. Yeah, yeah. No, he's a super talented guy. Uh, he just had. Uh, are we doing it? Yeah, we're, ro- uh, we're, we're rolling. rolling. We okay. just roll right into it. Uh, he's doing uh, Elgin James. He's uh, he had a movie come out this year, and I'm going to forget the name of it. Uh, Low Riders, maybe. Uh huh. But. Um, which he doesn't like to talk about because uh, not unlike what happened with me and uh, Southpaw, they, uh, you know, you know, a bunch of... It, there were changes were made. Yeah, changes yeah. were made much <laughs> to his dismay, uh-huh. so... Right. Um, but uh, now he's a super, he's a really talented cat. It's like one of those things where, uh, you know, that experience where you're, in a good way, you're in a room with somebody when I first met with him, and I... You have that realization of like, oh, this guy's way smarter than me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh-huh. just, you know, just operating on that different level mm-hmm. and and obviously very much uh, a different life experience, you know? I mean, he's kind of from the culture, isn't he? Yeah. He, yeah. Was, um, he was a guy who uh, came up and, you know, uh, uh, straight edge, right? And right. – uh, you know, some people call them gangbangers, and he had a different perceptive perception mm-hmm. of what they were doing. And uh, you know, he this it's is like a, the hardcore scene, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like in DC, and uh, uh, and you know, he uh, he was a punk rocker, you right. know. So they he traveled all over the world, and um, kind of they would leave little nuggets behind, and and as a result. Um, their organization grew and uh, um, became somewhat worldwide. And, uh, you know, then after 9-11, all those organizations got classified as terrorists. Right. And and it just went in a completely different direction. And, uh, you know, he ended up doing some time and, you know, uh, for what he believed in. And, uh, but um, really uh, just a solid guy and loyal and super smart and like rigidly like you know those dudes that have that kind of focus yeah yeah, yeah. Where you just go wow yeah he <laughs> you just know? hone in on it yeah i know he's uh he's friends with my boy john joseph who's mm-hmm. from that from that world as well yeah, he john, knows he knows everybody yeah, yeah yeah like i'll uh you know i'll walk into um crossroads you know yeah and uh, well that's like the mecca for all that you know, it, it really the hardcore is. like yeah. you know toby morse Yep. He's part of that kind of and, world uh, as well. And I know Travis really well. Travis, and, and I usually yeah. go and, and meet Travis there. And, uh-huh. and every, every time I go, Elgin's there with somebody else. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like some other player, you know. Well, it's weird because it's such a fancy, you know, fancy vegan restaurant. Really and like is. all these super intense, like hardcore, straight edge punk rock guys. Yeah. Like that's like their clubhouse. It is. You it know? is. It's, <laughs> and it's, it's really good. And, uh-huh. and uh, uh, I know you had Travis yeah. on, and, uh-huh. and I, I love that dude. And, yeah, uh, he's amazing. He's an amazing guy. And uh, I just, I like, uh, you know, I try to have lunch with him at least once or twice a year just mm-hmm. to, you know, get a little bit of what he's got. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. uh, uh, it's so funny. The last time I had lunch with him, uh, his dad, he brought his dad along. And I, oh, I love that. It was uh-huh. just sort of like my dad's in town, and, he, and his dad was at the table. And, uh, you know, it's at first you're like, Oh, okay. What, what's the, like, how do I, and then like, he's just, he's just so real mm. and like, so open that within 10 minutes, like, you know, his dad just became part of that dynamic yeah. and didn't say a whole lot, but it was sort of like, wow, that's 
like I don't know if I would have the capacity to trust my own, you know, social interaction skill to drop somebody into that situation who did, you know what I mean? And then just incorporate them into the whole conversation. Right. Without it being like a lot of legwork beforehand. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and then you, you embrace it. And then by the time you're done, you're like, he just took a, you know, he made it a completely different experience mm -hmm. without intending to. Do you mean, know what I mean? Like, like, what do you mean by that? Just by, by, like get providing the space for his dad to just be yeah, there comfortably. Like it was just there, and it was yeah, it was, and 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 his dad, you know, a really su sweet guy, and and didn't chime in much, and and you know, we Travis would go out of his way to include him when you know when it made sense, but it was just you know it was just like oh we're just it was like oh. I'm just sitting here with a member of your family yeah. and you yeah, yeah. and you and, and us engaging and him being part of it. Uh, so that, you know, I realized that it, you know, it, I had to make the adjustment in terms of like not thinking that I had to then change how I interacted right, with him right, because right. the dad, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it made it a different experience for me so that when I was done, I I was like, Oh, that was, that was really, you know, that was really cool. That was, that would be a situation that normally might make me uncomfortable. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, how do I include this guy? Mm -hmm. And because, you know, Travis is just so bloody there yeah. and real and his dad is kind of the same way uh -huh. that it was like, you have no choice, but to kind of let it become what it's supposed to become, you know, so that, you know, by the end it was like, well, that was awesome. You know, where there was no like, oh, you know, I guess what I go to is trying to do that with my old man, uh -huh. like when he was living, it just would be a different, <laughs> it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked out that way. It would yeah. be a different circumstance. Well, I think it, it speaks to, you know, like, look, you know, Travis is a, you know, he's a sensitive artist, but he's very, he knows who he is mm -hmm. and he's totally comfortable with that. And yes. he doesn't, he's not, he's not going to try to make other people, you know, feel like go out of his way to be somebody else to make other people comfortable. Right. right? But to be able to embody that in a tricky social context is right. another thing, right? Yeah. And just, you know, I guess because it's often, you know, parental inclusion into things can be a loaded dynamic, of right? Course. And the fact that he loves his dad and, and this is just part of his day, um, you know, it was just sort of that energy and you're like, oh, okay, uh -huh. that's – that was just that, you know, his dad was here and his dad is going to be part of his day. Whatever <laughs> Travis is doing today, uh -huh. dad will be part of it. Uh -huh. And I was part of that thing. You know what yeah. I mean? And I just, you know, I just, I was like, mm, no, nah, I couldn't do that with my old man. <laughs> no, it was going to happen. Well, I, I want to hear more about that. But before we do that, I, I think like it's interesting you bring up Travis because you guys are – I mean, you're very, you're very different people, but I, but there's similarities that I see in you guys in that you have this kind of public persona that's all about like, you're sort of like a tough guy, you know, like, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, I got things figured out right, and, right. and, you know, don't cross me, right. you know, arms cross kind of thing right, right. that Travis has. But then you talk to him and he's like the sweetest guy and he wears his emotions on his sleeve. And he, mm -hmm. like you said, he's totally present. And, yeah. and with you, like, because I've known you as long as I have, you know, and I know you outside the context of Hollywood, uh, I see like your public persona and I see kind of what you put out, you know, on, on Twitter and the like, and that's changed. That's evolved. Certainly. Like, mm -hmm. and I want to explore that with you, <laughs> but there's such a, to me, I'm like, these look like two different people. Like, cause the Kurt I know is like this really sweet, kind, giving present family guy, dad, you know, husband, uh, you know, always, always there, you know, to be of support or with a hug. And, and then I see like the, some of the, you know, some of the spats that you get into that end up, you know, turning into these things and, and stuff <laughs> that gets written. I was like, I just, he's like, wait, who's that guy? Uh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that unfortunately, <laughs> we don't have to talk about this if you don't want no, to. No, no, no. I would say uh, that unfortunately they both are me. Yeah. Meaning, you know, I, of course, you know, but I will say that I, you know, 
you know, I, I, I used to lead perhaps a uh, way to say it is I used to lead with that. Right. Mm. I used to lead with, um, you know, my, uh, very accessible anger. Right. And, uh, because it worked for me, right. It sort of was, um, creatively, it's sort of what I was known for. And, uh, uh, and, and then after a while, and yes, it definitely got me in trouble on more than one occasion, but it also, it's exciting. It's exciting. And yeah. it left, you know, and, and for better or for worse, that's, you know, people remembered it. Right. But then I think what ended up happening is I just, just got boring, mm. you know what I mean? Because what ends up happening is you think, oh, I have to then, when you get to the place where you feel like you need to sustain it yeah. or drum it up, that's when you realize now it's bullshit, uh-huh. you know? And, uh, and I think I just reached that point where I, I wasn't, you know, perhaps that angry anymore, or I didn't have to push back as much because I had, you know, um, a track record of success. Yeah. So I wasn't constantly, you know, in, uh, warrior mode. Mm -hmm. And then, so, and, you know, and then I realized, well, I can't, that's to sort of lead with that then becomes bullshit. Well, it becomes a character then. Exactly. And and my, my perspective on it is that. Yeah. What's your perspective? Well, (laughs) it's probably much much better than mine. you know, look, at times it was salacious. And like I said, it was exciting, <laughs> but it was always rooted in truth. Like you were, you were in a certain respect, like it was, it was speaking truth to power. Like it was always like coming, there was always like some aspect of what you were saying was something that needed to be said and something that, that a lot of other people also observed, but for a variety of reasons, just were never going to say that thing, you right, know, and right. like you would, you would, you had the balls, you had the courage, you had the, you know, maybe short sightedness, <laughs> you know, at, at certain times to go, Hey, wait a minute. Like, this is bullshit. Like mm-hmm. we got to call this out. So it, it, I always felt like it came from a genuine place. Um, it, but it, 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 it was, did, that, yeah. you know, but there's a, there's a like stirring the pot thing. And I think, you know, to contextualize it, like that was probably early mid, Sons of Anarchy, where mm-hmm. you're trying to make your stamp on the world and, and right. you know, trying to make sure that people were kind of seeing this project that you were birthing in the way that you wanted it to be seen, right? Yeah, I think that's true. I, uh, I mean, it was never, it was never disingenuous, right? It was never like bullshit. Um, you know, there were times where I definitely, you know, intentionally, you know, provocateur. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, poked a few eyeballs. Right. Um, but it was never, um, it was always rooted in something that I felt strongly about. Uh, and I think what happened is that I felt comfortable enough or perhaps, um, I was, uh, careless enough <laughs> to, you know, rattle that cage and say things that perhaps other people may have felt but wouldn't necessarily yeah. either have the balls or perhaps, you know, were too smart to say. Uh, so that was, you know, that was definitely uh, part of it early on. And it was always, you know, uh, you know, uh, anger was always a survival tool for me, right? Mm-hmm. So it was about channel, you know, channeling that piece of me into, uh, you know, into something that perhaps could serve me better than throwing a fist at somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, you know, it definitely, you know, it definitely got me into trouble. Uh, some, you know, early on, but it created a lot of notoriety too. Yeah, and I can't deny a lot that. of attention yeah, you know, right. on you. I mean, it's like you know, de- what's you know, there's like you would tweet something and there'd be a whole like Nikki Fink would write like a whole article about it. It'd be some deadline piece, right? About what and you I, said. And I think when I got to the place where I felt like that became disingenuous, right? Where it was more about you know drumming up controversy than really perhaps uh, whether. Uh, proper or improper uh, 
speaking out about something I really believed in, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, not that I wasn't aware of the impact it would have, but I think what happened is I got to a place where I was just sort of like, do I really believe that? Or is that me just trying to, you know, is that me reading my own press clippings and thinking I had something to sustain? Yeah. And that's when it sort of like, and you know, like anything else, you, you, uh, I don't know if, you know, mature may be too strong of a word, but uh, you realize that you don't have to work so hard at it anymore, you know? And I think that's what happened to me is that people understood who I was. People, there was, you know, respect for what I did and I didn't have to swing so hard to, to do what I wanted to do, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, And, uh, and not that I don't occasionally take a punch now or swing at something because I do, but, uh, um, I, th- I think, you know, o- over time it just, I had to take a look at, well, what is, you know, what is me, when am I, when am I trying to just be controversial for the sake of being controversial and when am I using yeah. my notoriety to at the very least express something that, you know, uh, upsets me or I think is, is dubious or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I've noticed that you're not afraid to speak up when something moves you. I mean, you, you wrote a piece about Harvey Weinstein. You wrote a piece about like the Google anti-piracy thing. Like there are moments that you've chosen where you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to speak my piece on this. You know, you did a thing about on the, on the eve of the, the Trump election or on the, in the wake of that. Um, but like I checked your, I mean, you used to write a lot on your blog and like, mm-hmm. I think the last entry on your blog was like 2013 or something yeah. like that. Like you just cut that off. You know, what happened is, is really it's the power of, uh, Twitter and, and, um, just became a much more, uh, uh, powerful tool, you know, mm-hmm. than really, you know, because for a while the blog was, uh, was my, only means of kind of putting it out there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I, whether, you know, and I still would write pieces, but most of the pieces I wrote after that were for specific things, not so much for my own blog. Yeah, Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, it was just, I think it was, you know, just the shift in, in how to best, um, engage an audience. Uh-huh. And then it really became about, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, Twitter and then ultimately, uh, Instagram, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and then I just, and I also got tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to use the word like the mellowing, you know, cause I, I'm not sure that's accurate, but on some level, either you have worked through some of these anger issues and you have a healthier <laughs> relationship with your emotional landscape, or you just feel like you're understood and heard. And so you don't feel that you can like sublimate those impulses that you still have. I think it's a little bit of both. I'd like to, I hope there's been some growth so over, a the last, growth <laughs> over the last, last 10, 10 years. years. I hope so too. You know, no, I think there has been, you know, you know, I think kids will do that to you and, uh, um, and look, you know, I think you, you, uh, success, um, creates a, a, a certain amount of, um, personal, uh, security, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, so that you don't, you know, the fear impulse that drives me, I think subsided as, you know, the work spoke f- for itself. Right. So I didn't feel like I had, you know, failure chomping at, you know, you know, you're on the third show that you've created. You have this amazing relationship with FX and, you know, you know, they have your back, even though you get into scruffs with them. Like, you you know, I would hope that you could like breathe a little bit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So there's definitely feeling like, um, you know, I have the network uh, and by network, not necessarily FX, but the network of people mm-hmm. around me that uh, know who I am and can support that and protect me. And yeah. uh, so it's, you know, it's it's definitely, you know, that uh, has, you know, changed my approach or uh, and uh, and, you know, it's also, uh, you know, it's a different uh, 
Uh, it's a different landscape now too, man. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a much more, you know, what you say and what you do, you know, the, the public perception is so mercurial right now. And, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I would be foolish if I didn't check myself. You got a lot to lose. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, uh, or just, uh-huh. you know, know that, um, you know, I've been lucky in the past, right. If I use my, um, you know, early on when I was, you know, sending out all those crazy tweets about the Emmys, right. That, you know, I was alone in my office cracking myself up and then they were all picked up and I got a call from my wife saying, what's some, are you going insane? What's happening? People are freaking out. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then I just realized, oh my God, they're like, they're all being picked up and people, yeah. people think I'm sitting there with a gun in my mouth, it's, you know? Yeah. And I was like, that was when I realized, oh. Tone can be <laughs> yeah. misconstrued. Yeah. Uh, so, um, that was a little bit of a tirade, though. Yeah, it was definitely a tirade. Yeah. But I was I was cracking myself up, but apparently no one else. Um, so you know, I have you know, I definitely uh, uh, you know have that historical awareness. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, you know, it's uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely it's a different uh, it's a different landscape, you know. Now it's and, a different landscape in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah, one one false move and you're done. You know, it's like you, you know, I think like there's a climate of like you kind of have to, you know, have to make sure that you're, you know, really paying attention to how you behave in a public forum. Yeah. And with somebody with your profile, like, you know, I would imagine that has to play on your conscience a little bit in terms of how you yeah. <laughs> navigate the treacherous waters of social media. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's also, I think the landscape of television has changed tremendously since, you know, The Shield and even, and, and even, you know, sons of anarchy. It's like, you know, I know this, this term gets thrown around pretty casually, but it, it really is this amazing golden age. Like there's this mm. incredible content out there and, you know, the quality of programming in television is, is just, it's unprecedented. Mm. And as a storyteller, I would imagine that, you know, it's, it's exciting for you because it seems like from somebody who's not in that world, uh, that there's a lot of freedom to explore storytelling in a longer format that can breathe in this, you know, sort of binge culture that we're now in. No, it's, it's, uh, it's really true. I think, uh, um, you know, it's interesting. It's, I, you know, I, 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 I've definitely, uh, rattled cages, uh, even at FX along the way. And, uh, but Landgraf always kind of had your, yeah, he's kind of been your he hero has, from but, the beginning, but you you guys get into it. Yeah, right? you know, you can only call a guy a cunt so many times <laughs> yeah. before he he has to sit you down and say, you know, look. I think he said like he said like you know he pulls out the Jerry Maguire line like let me help you like help me help you <laughs> know, Kurt I come know. on. So there's definitely been uh, you know some of that along the way, but I I, I do I I, uh, I love John. I consider him a friend, and uh, um, uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, uh, you know, the landscape now is, you know, it's really, uh, it's really changed, you know, and, uh, and now, you know, like I just, um, with the onset of, of, of Mayans and, and I just, you know, it made sense to re-up my deal at, uh, at 20th mm-hmm. and, uh, and then my first look is at FX and, so but, you know, like a multi-year overall deal. It's a three-year year deal. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's the first time I had to, you know, in, you know, with, you know, the potential of the the Disney ownership looming, it's the first time I had a sit down before anything was signed uh-huh. where, you know, I was given a talking to and not so much, you know, uh, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, I've mellowed to a certain extent and, and, but they know me well enough. Yeah. <laughs> so Disney's a whole other deal. Yeah. And yeah. it was, and it wasn't so much about don't be yourself as much as don't be stupid, mm-hmm. you know? And, and at that point I, I, I got it. And, uh, and, and I have tremendous respect for, uh, Dana Walden, who I also consider a friend and, uh, and, and John Langreff. And it was, you know, it was that conversation, but even, you know, even though it was a, a supportive and we love you kind of a meeting, the fact that the meeting still took place, 
suggests so people got together and said we need to we need to we should probably get in touch with Kurt and sit right. down with him. Well, <laughs> look what what they're doing, quite honestly, and 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 um, you know, and 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 I don't blame them. Right? Is they're you know they're doing the due diligence yeah. of saying you know we did our part in terms of letting this artist know you know what the perhaps new rules of engagement are, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so that, you know, to a certain extent, they're protected if I, <laughs> you know, go off the rails. Um, but, uh, but it was also, it's interesting. It's like, like I said, and it was, it was a very, you know, it was uh, a very sort of friendly and, and supportive conversation, right? But uh, the fact that we had to have that conversation really suggests a shift in the paradigm, you know what I mean? And, uh, and look, I, you know, everything kind of happens for, I believe everything sort of happens for a reason. And, uh, um, uh, and that, you know, all the stuff that's happening now in Hollywood, uh, and, and other industries, you know, had to happen, has Mm -hmm. to happen. And, uh, and from it, what will shake loose, I think is, uh, is perhaps a, a more a, a safer and and healthier you know landscape, but this is you know this is the uh, uh, the battle you know this is the this is where people you know get bloody and make mistakes and mm-hmm. and this is the 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 time when you know uh, things get sh- you know everything sh- we're know. in that in between phase yeah we're you know? we're shaking it all yeah. up to see what it what it's supposed to and look there's, like there's you know. There's going to have to be a lot of casualties along the way before yes. we see our way clear of yeah. the old paradigm and into the new paradigm. Yeah. I mean, you, uh, I mean, you worked with Weinstein on Southpaw, right? Like, yes. what was your experience with him? Um, you know, I never had a, a face-to-face with uh, uh, with Harvey. Uh, there was several email exchanges, and they were all very, you know, uh, uh, friendly. You know, it was really about. Excuse me. It was really about when we were getting beginning to promote the movie, mm-hmm. and uh, um, and asking me to, you know, uh, do interviews and and uh, and things like that, and uh, um, you know, basically, um, <laughs> it was you know, how much can I get you to do for free (laughs) kind of a thing. Uh And, and I, you know, and I, and I got that and I did as, as much as I, I could do. I couldn't travel and to, to promote, but I, you know, I did, um, I did a couple of WGA things and, uh, but it was, it was, you know, he was very, um, supportive of the movie and, uh, and look, Antoine's a friend of mine and, uh, we, you know, there was a lot of negotiation, you know, there were rewrites on that movie that that on Southpaw that you know didn't work, and so it was you know it was this sort of creative covert op that would mm-hmm. happen. I would get home from Sons, and I would sit down with him at like from ten till two in the morning, going right. through pages, writing stuff for the next day, and and that basically I think just became an outline um, <laughs> because my whole argument for arbitration when it came down to who got credit because there was like they brought in two or three other writers my whole my whole argument for arbitration was they didn't follow any script so by default that you go back to me (laughs) and and that works and it's the truth so you got sole credit i got sole credit and it's and it's true like there was whatever you know it was it was the heart of basically the original draft which Mm -hmm. is what antoine loved and wanted to make um but as far as actual words on the page it would be like I'd be, hmm, where's what, what, where's what, where is that? Which you know? movie is this? But yeah. you know, uh, so that and and it was like one of my ma- and uh, you know and my agents and my lawyer, you know, they've not had great experience with arbitration and for clients, and they're like, look, don't you know, don't expect you know, uh, and. It ended up turning around being one of the quickest arbitrations Uh because my argument was so simple. And really, there was no documentation of any draft that became the uh, – when TV, it's called an ASBROAD in terms of what was actually said, Mm -hmm. right? So they were like, oh, you got a point. Right. You couldn't track it back to anyone else. Right. So because the – 
the m- movie was mine and the original script and concept was mine, it, it just sort of by default went back to yeah. sole credit. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, um, which, you know, uh, you know, was as far as they were concerned was the first time anyone ever used that tactic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, I'd be interested to know whether anybody has used it since, since it was so effective, <laughs> but the, the, you know, the story behind that movie is pretty interesting. I mean, originally this was an idea that you had that you worked with Marshall Mathers, Eminem. Yeah. On. He was going to start, he was, this was going to be his eight mile follow up. Yeah, it really was. It was, they came to me, uh, early on and, um, uh, and, uh, and this is before Antoine was around and, uh, 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 you know, um, Marshall's, um, producing team and, uh, um, uh, and they wanted to do a, a remake of the champ. And I was like, ah, uh-huh. don't do a remake of the champ. And, uh, and then it's when I pitched, let's, let's do like, let's continue telling his story through the analogy of boxing. Right. So the continuation of his life, you know, so mm. when proof was killed, it's sort of when, you know, the wife was killed. So it was you, literally taking the paradigm of what happened to him uh, and then using that as, you know, sort of the, the story, uh, uh, you know, the story uh, paradigm, right? So, uh, and they loved that idea. And then we pitched it around and it ended up uh, – with uh, Stacy Snyder when she was at DreamWorks and they loved the idea. And at that point, Marshall was on board and his team. And, uh, and then we were, uh, then we sat down and were interviewing or met with directors and, you know, and Antoine came in and, uh, you know, Antoine, obviously, you know, a lot of success with training day and, um, but had kind of lost his way a little bit in terms of, well, that's not fair to say, um, in terms of studio successes, right, uh, was still, you know, looking for that groove. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I had worked with Antoine previously on a, on a project that I had written for Warners and that didn't go, but became friends with him. And, uh, and he came in to this pitch, like living the story, yeah. like he grew up, uh, I think he grew up in Philly and, you know, boxing kind of saved his life. So, you know, it was really, it became this sort of personal story for him. And, uh, that really impressed me and, and, and Stacy and, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, all of Marshall's people. And, uh, we, uh, we locked him down and, you know, and then as things happened, uh, Marshall, you know, uh, at that point I think was clean and sober and I think reevaluating whether or not he wanted to get into a circumstance that, you know, Eight Mile kind of f- fucked him up, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I think Curtis Hansen kind of put him through the ringer. And uh, and I think he, you know, this is just my speculation, but that he didn't know if he wanted to risk new sobriety on that circumstance mm-hmm. again. And and I kind of understood it, right? So it went into turnaround and, uh, and then Harvey came around and liked the story and liked it for Jake and about a year and a half later or so that came back around and, uh, I met with Jake and, uh, uh, I think, uh, I've told this story. Uh, I know the story, you know, like, the story. Uh, yeah, Should I yeah, tell that yeah, story? Yeah, just tell it cause it's good. Uh, because, uh, uh, my, uh, my relationship with Jake prior to that was, uh, um, we had li- we were living in the Hills and, uh, um, Hollywood Hills and, uh, someone moved into a house like across from us. So there's a big ravine, right? So I don't know how many hundreds of yards between our houses, but uh, somebody moved in and, and then for two nights in a row, somebody was out there like building, like banging hammers to like, you know, midnight. Right. And by the third night I was like, fuck this guy. So, <laughs> so I'm, I stand out on the, you know, uh, uh, from the from our the end of our, our our property there as high up as I could and I'm screaming you know uh, hey you, you think maybe you know you can you can fucking chill the fucking home improvement it's it's like you know eleven o'clock at night and I'm screaming and all I hear is a pause and okay <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. right so then like three or four days later there's a knock on my door and I open the door and it's Jake yeah and he's like. Uh, 
Yeah, I just want to retell. We share. I just moved into the house, and we share some mutual property that we need to trim trees. And I'm sitting to him, listening. And he's talking. And I went, "Were you the guy?" And he's like, "Yeah, that was me." I'm like, <laughs> "Of course it was." Uh-huh. <laughs> so that was yeah. that, that was that was this Jake's like, introduction this is to me. The foundation of this relationship, <laughs> when the prospect of him like starring in this movie that you wrote that you really wanted for Eminem right. comes up. So, but the second part of that, I think, is just as like sort of entertaining. Yeah. So we sit down and. Uh, um, and so, you know, after that, we, we laughed, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and then we were in contact with him because we shared a property line and we had done all this work right. and it's like rich white guy, Hollywood problems. Yeah, really. It really you is. Know, it's like, like, Oh, the trees yeah, are too, you know, the trees are overgrowing and my yeah. movie star neighbor. And yeah. like, you know, right. it, it was, it was, it was that crime your river. And, uh, uh, and he was a lovely guy and, and, and really, you know. Uh, uh, I really, you know, uh, had a good sense of humor about my rage. Uh, so, and then, uh, over time he had actually moved, I think by the time this project came up, but that was our, you know, that was the basis of our relationship. And when Harvey said that he really liked Jake for this project, like to me, it was so hard for me to wrap my head around anybody but Marshall doing it mm-hmm. because it was written for him about him. It was, you know, and then it was based on his life, you know, gr- granted, you know, an analogy and, and, but, uh, so I couldn't like, couldn't wrap my brain around it. And, um, so I was, you know, I was like, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, uh, it's not, I don't get it. It's not going to work. And when I met Jake, uh, you know, he was a lovely guy and he had a really, um, it was interesting because he had his perspective on who the character was. And in that meeting, I found myself creatively like tensing up, like that's not who he is, you know? And then, and then I don't know what happened. I think it was just like enough time had passed and I perhaps wasn't so, you know, immediately invested in every word, uh, which is probably a good thing considering none of my words Mm -hmm. ended up in it. But, uh, I think I was just, I just, something happened and, it, and I, and there was a shift and I suddenly went, oh, that's what you think it is. Right. And I was able to realize, of course, you know, everyone is entitled, uh, to, uh, their interpretation of it. Right. And, and what I realized is that he was a really smart cat, right. He wasn't like, you know, mm-hmm. he was a really smart guy and, and, and I think really understood the character in a way that perhaps I wasn't able to see it, right? He was looking at it from a different way. And I think it's ultimately why, even though a lot changed, I realized because, you know, at that point I was still, you know, 80% of my year was was buried in the show, right. that I realized that Jake and Antoine knew this character better than I did. Like they understood. Who and we, once Marshall's not involved anymore, you can unshackle yourself from exactly you know, the, the limitations of it having to be his story. Exactly. And, allowing it to be something and, else. and that was hard, you know, creatively it was hard. I'm very, you know, look, I'm very proprietary over my stuff and, and because I, you know, I'm not a casual writer. Do you know what I mean? Like I spend a lot of time and energy and investment in every word and, and every action that's in a script. Right. So, but I realized that uh, I, you know, that these two men, uh, Jake and, and Antoine at that point, really knew this movie better than I did. And I had to be willing to let that go and, right, and support that. it as best mm-hmm. as I could. And I did with rewrites and, you know, mm-hmm. and most of my rewrites, I think, were about, you know, guiding them in the context of what the whole story became. You know, and then I think a lot of it just really became improvisational once they understood that. Yeah. It was just basically protecting the arc of the piece because I think that's what Antoine, you know, is an amazing shooter. Um, but I think what Antoine um, needs help with sometimes is remembering, you know, how each scene is layered into the overall arc of a piece, right? Yeah. And that's what I think I was able to provide and uh, – uh, and ultimately let it become what it was supposed to become, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I enjoyed it. You know, I don't know what your perspective is on the finished product, but, but I think, you know, first of all, 
you got to have huge balls to even attempt a boxing movie because of the history of boxing know, movies and, and all the tropes that are kind of built into that. Like, right. how do you say something unique and do something compelling in that genre when there's so many outstanding examples? It seems like everything's sort of been explored and done. Yeah. But I felt like it, 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 it merged kind of what you expect, like the best of what that genre has to offer while also inverting it by throwing some, you know, curveballs at you that like you don't see coming. Mm. Plus, like Jake was super ripped in that movie. I like, know. I don't know how he got that fit, but it was insane. Well, that was, yeah. it's interesting. I, I, you know, I wasn't that involved in 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 the actual production, but I was. I did as much as I could prior to in terms of rewrites and and being available. And and then as it was being shot, you know, my late night rendezvous with uh, uh, with Antoine in terms of revisions and stuff like that, because it was like a covert ops yeah. piece, you know. And so, like, I don't think people understand, like, what an all-consuming full-time job, like, being a showrunner is. Like, I can't believe that you had any bandwidth whatsoever to do anything outside of that. Well, at that point, I was invested. I really, you know, it, look, it's still my only, you know, feature credit, and and I really wanted to feel, like, like the thought of abandoning it at that point mm. felt wrong. So I felt like I wanted to support Antoine and Jake and and contribute what I could um, so yeah, it really became when I came home from, you know, my day job, uh, putting as much energy as I possibly could into that, you know, yeah. and look, it wasn't, you know, it was a, like, a, you know, it was a, it was a quick shoot, right. You know, in terms of, uh, being however many days, 30 days, maybe 40 days. And, uh, um, but, uh, no, I'm, you know, I, uh, I think Jake did, uh, did a great job and, and, and look, I think they leaned into, you know, a lot of tropes that I probably would have tried to avoid, but also, you know, I had to trust that, you know, I guess there's a, there is an expectation, uh, being a boxing movie for those mile markers you have to reach, mm -hmm. you know, what fans expect yeah. or whatever. But, uh, uh, so, you know, I had mixed feelings about it, but ultimately, you know, I felt like Antoine did a great job. I felt like Jake, um, yeah, I remember, when I met Jake, he was doing Nightcrawler. So he was like that big, you know, he right. was really, he was that. lean and, and, uh, and I thought, you know, mm, middleweight, mm, I don't, you know, yeah. and, uh, and then the next time I saw him was in New York and maybe six weeks later and he was a beast already. In six weeks. In six weeks. Wow. But he's just one of those guys, like he's a natural athlete right. mm -hmm. and he's just one of those Dudes that, you know, I personally hate who can like drop like and, and shred and, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he was, when I saw him, he was a beast and, uh, um, and, you know, is a natural athlete. So, uh, I think he was, you know, uh, had moved along at a rate faster than, uh, I forget, uh, uh, Terry was his name. I forget Terry's last name who was training him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I think even Terry was sort of stunned at, his level of quickly. how quickly, yeah. you know, and it's just who he is, you know, and, and, you know, I think he created a really interesting character. He was, he was kind of, you know, barbaric, you know, and uh, in a way that I had never seen him before. Mm -hmm. So I really admired his performance, you know, and uh, uh, I, it was beautiful. I loved the way uh, Antoine shot it. So, you know, I was able to sort of, I remember I watched it. I was in, I was in L uh, London doing Bastard at the time and, uh, ended up, uh, going the Soho house in, uh, in Soho, uh, went and, uh, went to their private screening room and, uh, watched it with, uh, I think Katie and just Sarah and Jackson at the time. And, uh, we just, you know, had a private screening and, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, came out of that feeling like, okay, I'm glad my name's on it. You know, I didn't write much of it, <laughs> but I'm glad my name's it's on it. It's such a weird thing, right? <laughs> like you're the, I mean, you know, like the average person would look at that and just assume you wrote every word in that movie and that's not how it works. And I, I think it, it's, it, it speaks to kind of a broader issue that I want to get into you, with you, which is like, how do you, you know, nav navigate being a creative person, being an artist, you know, being somebody who's passionate about the work that they do in a construct in which, it's a team sport really. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know you well enough to know that like you're a guy who likes to lock yourself in a room and like do your thing. And, you know, 
people, if you can avoid people, you're going <laughs> to avoid people, right, right. you know? And it's so funny that the universe yeah. has thrown you, you know, this life in which not only do you have to collaborate with people, like you have to be like the general and the soldier, like you, you have to be the practitioner and the architect of everything that you do. So I can't imagine very many other jobs where you, you have to be more enmeshed with people than, than what you do. Yeah, so it's like, I, you know, I, I would imagine there was a learning curve with that. Like, and I think it also, you know, kind of ancillary to that is how do you maintain the vision for, you know, what you're trying to accomplish while also allowing that space to, you know, be in gratitude and in surrender and like empower all these people that are mm. talented in their own right to be expressive. All right. Now, uh, uh, you know, I, it's, it's interesting that I, you know, I was never, you know, I'm a late bloomer, right? Like I didn't figure shit out till, you know, I was in my early forties. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, some of it was going back to grad school, you and me you know, both, brother. you know, uh, and I, you know, I went back to grad school in my early thirties and, and was going to teach and direct, uh, theater and, and it was in grad school. I started writing and, you know, that sort of then dictated my path. So there was this really, this very long circuitous path that led me to um, what I'm doing. Uh, and I have, you know, obviously a lot of gratitude for that. But, you know, uh, prior to that, anything I had written, like the concept of draft never entered my mind, right? Like I would produce something and if you didn't, you know, think it was, you know, the most potent and brilliant thing you would have ever written, you'd ever read, then clearly it was a piece of shit. Uh -huh. So, you know, just a binary thing. Yeah. So the fact that I, my career became something that has to embrace the concept of draft is, you know, is definitely, you know, uh, in a bigger picture, you know, the lesson that I had to learn, uh -huh. right? Because I was then to be successful, I had to be willing to let people share an opinion about what was wrong with something I was doing and, and take it to heart, try to figure out what was useful, you know, what I could throw away and what, how to apply what they said to make something better. Mm -hmm. And clearly there was a, a, a learning curve doing that. Um, but that, you know, that perhaps was the biggest hurdle. And, uh, uh, and I was able to get through a lot of that in just trying to write features uh, so that by the time I got to, uh, the shield, you know, uh, then I didn't have a choice, right? Because I would write drafts and I would get notes from my showrunner mm -hmm. and from other writers. And, you know, I may push back for stuff I believed in, but ultimately I couldn't say, fuck you, write it yourself. Well, you were like a junior, <laughs> junior staff, the, the was, first year was, junior staff, yeah, first, first writer, yeah. right. Was, Se season one of the yeah. shield. So I was, you know, you start out at the bottom and, uh, um, but it was interesting. I was, uh, um, and I always tell this story. Uh, my my buddy uh, Scott Rosenbaum was also the other staff writer on that show, and I had never written in TV before. I never pursued TV, and and I liked TV. And yeah. and my agents were like, you know, you should write some specs, and and uh, you know. So I got this gig after you know a couple seasons of trying to pursue TV work. Well, you wrote, you wrote like a, like a crazy spec script of uh, Ali McBeal spec script. And yeah. A West Wing spec. Yeah. I wrote script, a crazy right? Ali McBeal, yeah. like, you know, um, yeah, that's so funny. You remember that, uh, uh, like, a an S and M Ali McBeal. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I can't even imagine you, <laughs> like your voice in that, in that framework. And, so. uh, and then, a like a West Wing where, you know, eight year olds were shooting like, un unfortunately somewhat prescient <laughs> oh, in terms of like what ultimately happened, uh, but uh, and are you trying to like a, a, like adopt some kind of Sorkin esque like meter when you write dialogue in that, or are you just being yourself? I, I couldn't. You know what I tried to do in terms of the show was the rhythm, right? Because uh -huh. it had a fast rhythm. Uh, I don't. You know, I think it's impossible to. Uh, it's like trying to imitate Mamet, right? It's mm -hmm. an, it's really difficult to to uh, uh, try to mirror or ape that. Uh, rhythm, mm -hmm. you know, but I did sort of understand the dynamic of who the characters were and what the relationships were. Um, but that, that, uh, West wing was, uh, what got me the job on the shield. 
Because at that point, that's what you did to get a job. You wrote a spec of a, of a successful show. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so, but the interesting thing is I started that job and I had never written on a TV show, nor did I, luckily, didn't really know the rules, right? Like I got the show and I, there was a contract that was for seven years, right? And, and I just thought like, oh, okay. So, you know, if the show continues, I, I'll, you know, I, I'll keep working. What I didn't know is that, you know, each season your, your option had to be picked yeah. up, right? And a lot of times if you go into a gig, if you have two staff writers, a lot of times, you know, only one of them makes the jump. Mm -hmm. So my buddy, uh, Scott Rosenbaum, had written on TV shows before and was aware of that dynamic. So I remember showing up and I just remembered, God, this guy is so fucking competitive, man. Yeah, he's going to bury you. Yeah, and, and, and so and I, and I, was just, I was just sort of taken back by it. And then, of course, I realized, you know, how competitive I was myself, right? So then, it, but it wasn't about the job. It was about, well, fuck this, you know, it just became about, the you ideas. know, the idea. And, and it wasn't until, like, really as the season was winding down, that I became aware that my option had to be picked up. Mm. And I, and as, as, as a big of a shock that was in terms of why didn't anybody tell me that? And I realized, well, it's a blessing that nobody told me that because had I known that it may have shifted my dynamic into a much more sort of defensive mm -hmm. or judging everything I was saying yeah. or looking at all my relationships differently. And the ego. Yeah. And I was able just to sort of, be myself and and let my you know my warped sense of storytelling kind of flourish mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh and uh and really found my voice on that on that show you know uh well i think i, I want to explore kind of like uh you know your experience on the shield and how that led to sons and everything that's happened since but i think i think we should let's step it back because i want to <laughs> you know i want to know i want to understand like how this how this Kurt Sutter guy came to be right like it, it, it there's an interesting kind of backstory here that is the engine behind all of this growing up in New Jersey right right um, you want the sad fat kid story okay uh, <laughs> no not really but I do like first of all like 400 pounds like in high school yeah. like it's super hard for me to see that yeah you know uh uh Grew up in, in like, uh, suburb Jersey, mm -hmm. um, uh, the town, I grew up in a town called Clark. I usually say Rawway because I lived like, you know, five blocks from the Rawway border uh -huh. and people knew Rawway because of the prison and scared straight. Yeah. So it was just easier and it sounded more Yeah, badass. they got IMDB. It says like, you know, grew up in the shadow of the oh. Rawway. He's like, it, it sounds so melodramatic. I know, you know? yeah. I was so proud of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was already marketing myself, you <laughs> yeah. know, um, my first year on the shield. Uh, but um, uh, so, you know, grew up in really sort of, you know, um, middle class uh, suburbia. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, was, uh, you know, I, in hindsight, I look at it now and realize it's, uh, you know, it was the youthful manifestation of, uh, of my isms, you know, of my, uh, alcoholism and, and my, uh, my holes, so to speak. Um, but I, uh, you know, from an early age, uh, you know, I was just this uber sensitive dude and, uh, and I didn't, nobody was mixing me cocktails mm. at, uh, you know, at three, four and five. And, uh, it became, uh, you know, food really became my, uh, uh, you know, uh, anesthetic and, uh, uh, you know, and so my weight gain was sort of proportional to, uh, life, right? So the more, uh, responsibility life demanded of me, the bigger I got, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where, you know, I was, uh, you know, oh, I say over 400 pounds cause the scale didn't go past 400, mm -hmm. uh, when I was, 19, wow. you know, mm -hmm. so, and I lost some weight in high school. I dropped like 60 pounds. My mom, God bless her, you know, sent me to uh, like one of the diet clubs and right. I dropped some weight, but then quickly put that back on and, and, and another 50. And, you know, and then I, I, I went to college, went to Rutgers and, 
you know, my first year, all I did was party and, you know, put on another 50 pounds of beer weight. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, of course didn't go to class. So, uh, ended up dropping out of Rutgers and, uh, uh, going to junior college. But, um, I don't know. I, there was something, uh, that happened. I think, uh, I just, uh, and I, you know, I tell this as a, uh, in a humorous way because it's funny, but it's really, uh, ultimately I think it's, uh, probably the truth, which was, you know, I realized that 400 pounds, uh, I wasn't going to get laid. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, 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 and not because women, you know, didn't like me. It's because, you know, they could die. So <laughs> <laughs> Fall on top of them. But like to get up to that size, I mean, my, uh, you know, the impression that I got from kind of like, you know, looking into the background of your story is, you know, uh, baby boomer parents, uh, you know, dad kind of is that emotionally detached dude. You know, we all know that guy. Yep. Uh, you know, mom, you know, mom begins to deal with that by drinking a little bit of, of herself. And so then that becomes an emotional removal for you. Right, right. And it's like, all right, well, where are you going to turn now? Yeah. Right. And so it's all right. It's like food. And then it's no surprise that it's, that it's booze. Right. You're ballooning up. Right. And at that, when does like, I mean, the first thing that kind of comes in, in terms of like your salvation is like this interest in acting, right? It's right. Like, what, writing doesn't come until much later. Yeah, I think it was, um, uh, yeah, I, I, and like I said, I, I, I think when I, you know, there was a certain amount of denial one has when they're younger, right? And then I think I just hit the wall at 19 where I realized, you know, is it, you know, this, it didn't, you know, Like I always describe, you know, it's like I, I was like the, you know, I was like, I had the, the personality of James Dean in the body of Paul Prudhomme, right? Like it just didn't fucking work, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. And so. You're like a super handsome <laughs> dude, like stuck in this other guy's body. So I just, um, you know, and then, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm really on my own, you know, sort of flip the switch and, and of course you know, there's a healthy component to it, but there's also a, an unhealthy component mm -hmm. to it in terms of, you know, that's when I really started relying on alcohol to take the edge off instead of food, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, I, I look at my alcoholism and my drug addiction and my food addiction as being so enmeshed in my twenties, it's hard to even pull them apart. Right. Cause when I wasn't doing one, I was doing the other. Right. Right. Well, it's all the same thing. You yeah. have this, you have this like, you know, discontentedness, this sense of like not wanting to feel the way that you feel and right. you're going to reach for whatever's in front of you. Yeah. It really is. Indiscriminately. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, you know, uh, I dropped, you know, and look, I was at an age where, and you know, the interesting thing is, and, uh, as heavy as I was, I was always like an athletic kid. Like I played baseball. I loved basketball, you know, so I was the kid playing full court basketball at 400 pounds, uh -huh. you know, uh, you know, it's amazing. I have like, you know, knees at this point, but, uh, so like the exercise component was, was easy for me. So when I, you know, made the decision to drop weight, I, you know, exercise became a big tool. And then ultimately, you know, you, you know, uh, you abuse that too. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, uh, you know, so I, I got down to, uh, you know, I dropped like 180 pounds, 190 or 190 pounds. And, uh, uh, in, you know, in like nine months. Wow. It was so just by just being like a beast on the stairmaster or whatever on the treadmill and you know, like, you know, I mean, is there like restrictive, you know, <laughs> like cocaine involved in that or well, like there was, you know. you know, cocaine ultimately became my maintenance tool. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But initially it was really, you know, it became this like, how little can I eat and still sort of do what I need to do? Right. Yeah. 
And uh, still like a control thing. That's oh, absolutely. Own, you know, is, yeah. um, in and of itself. It's, it, it was, you know, it was a form of, you know, anorexia. And, yeah. and then ultimately exercising became the bulimic part of that, right? Uh-huh. So, you know, look, I, it, it, it happened the way it happened and it had to, to a certain extent. And, uh, and it wasn't necessarily the healthiest process, but, you know, I got away with it because I was young. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and I, you know, but I always describe it as, you know, having my body size and doubling my insanity because I was now in the body of a normal looking dude, but I still had this head that was, you know, that whole skill set was built on, you know, you know, being 400 pounds and just disconnected and, uh, uh, and living, you know, in, in a great deal of fantasy. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, that really became the, the struggle in my twenties, you know, like maintaining the weight I would sort of, you know, I sort of maintained anywhere between like, you know, 180 and 220. I was always sort of somewhere in that, you know, but it was all, you know, it all became about binge and purge and, you know, all the things that, uh, all the different ways the ism manifests, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and still very much into not, to, you know, uh, I wasn't a big drug guy. Uh, uh, a lot, you know, cocaine was so prevalent in the eighties in New York where I was working. It was just part of the party circuit, mm-hmm. you know, but it was, it was mostly, um, uh, alcohol and, uh, uh, you know, and that became, you know, uh, you know, my, my coping mechanism for, you know, until, uh, you know, like all of us, it, it stops working. Yeah. It stops working. But, but it seems that you didn't have, it's not like you had some crazy flame out, like it just sort of ran its course and you're like, I can't do this anymore. I mean, what was the bottom? Um, I think what happened was I, Look, like I had, um, you know, my mom was alcoholic and I sort of had the blueprint, you know, I saw, uh, what my genetic predisposition was and, uh, um, and I'm a guy who, you know, uh, I kind of have to ride it, ride it out till it's completely beat up and done yeah. and drained, you know, even to this day, like Sprung working with dry. defects of character, right? I got to, you know, I got to try it every which way to make sure it's really is a defect before, <laughs> <laughs> before I'm willing to go, okay, it doesn't uh-huh. work. Right. So it was that kind of thing. And I, and I think I, I remember, um, uh, um, you know, I, I talked to, uh, I think it was my friend, Nicole, who ultimately became my agent you know, talking to her about it. And we both had our stuff and, uh, um, and, you know, and I would, I would like sort of whine in in her ear and, uh, and she, you know, pointed out that most people who aren't alcoholic, you know, don't struggle with the, uh, the complexities and the, uh, uh, the angst of whether or not they're alcoholic. <laughs> you know? And I just was like, and like, that was so obvious. And yet such a brand new concept to me, uh-huh. I was like, Oh, and then I just became willing. Uh, and I, and at that point I had moved back to New York. I was, um, studying with my mentor, uh, mm-hmm. Catherine Gately and to, to teach and direct theater. And, and I was just, I, you know, I was willing to let it go. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, you know, you realize your bottom is not quite as high as you think it is, right? Uh, and uh, uh, and that, uh, uh, you know, that'll be 25 years ago. Wow, that's um, amazing. So uh, you just you March, literally March just, something. you came in and that was, that was it. Yeah, like I had tried to get sober on my own. Mm-hmm. You know, like I was dry for nine months, you know, and, and, uh, and hadn't uh, drank and uh, – you know, and then what happens is you pick up again and uh, it's not a slow build again. You sort of pick up again and it's within weeks you're right back where you were, mm-hmm. usually worse, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, it was so, you know, I was so aware of what I was doing and uh, um, and I just, you know, I became, 
you know, exhausted by my own process of trying to figure out, you know, how to get well. Yeah. That I was just like, all right, I'll try it this way. Just intellectualizing it or yeah. looking for every other way of being able to yeah. you know, continue to do what you do, but not feel the way that you feel. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I mean, that's, it's not, that's not the usual story. Um, you know, with most people, it's, it's less of a, <clears throat> you know, of a, of a clean break like that or, you know, a linear path. But now looking at it, like, knowing that there's the food aspect of it and then there's the drugs and alcohol part of it. Like how do you manage like sort of recovery across those two different things? Because the solution is the same and yet it's also Mm -hmm. a little bit more complicated than that. You know, um, the drug and the drugs and alcohol of it, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, is, is a clean break. Right. So, not that it was easy, you know, um, but, uh, um, but, you know, they, in the, uh, the food program or, you know, over years anonymous, they talk about, you know, that, uh, if, uh, if the disease is a, is the tiger, you know, when you're sober, you can put the tiger in the cage, but mm-hmm. with food, you have to take that tiger out and walk it three times a day. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, you know, that, uh, has always been my, you know, uh, that to this day is the thing that, you know, I still struggle with, right. Is, uh, you know, is the main, you know, is maintaining that level of, you know, abstinence and, yeah. and, and, uh, um, and, uh, um, you know, the, you know, what is, you know, what's the normalcy in that process, you know, yeah. you know, cause I'm, you know, uh, and I don't, that's not a program I work anymore. And mm-hmm. whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still, it still can kick my ass on any given day. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the other program, uh, is the one that sort of, you know, is my, my daily tool for living. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, here's, I guess the best way to describe it is like, I'm so clear with drugs and alcohol. There's no, you know, there's no other route but sobriety, right? I'm always looking for another route in terms of food yeah, yeah. and but you know, like I'm always looking for the shortcut, you know? Like, and what does it look like now? I mean, we've talked a little bit about like the plant-based stuff with you. Right, right, I right. I, I don't know where you're at with it now and how that looks, but. I'm, uh. You know, I, I'm very, obviously, look, I'm, I'm, I'm health conscious and, and, uh, uh, and I, uh, uh, you know, I, I love, you know, working out and, and, uh, uh, and weight training has always been part of my emotional recovery, you know, and I still do that, uh, um, anywhere from three to five times a week, right? Uh-huh. So exercise and is still, you know, really how I, you know, keep that beast at bay. Uh, and uh, um, right now in terms of my food plan, it's strictly, I would say, pescatarian. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Uh, I do eat, you know, uh, I do eat fish, but um, uh, but pretty much everything else is I try to, uh, like I don't do about – it's been almost a year giving up, uh, uh, dairy and mm-hmm. wheat and, you know, yeah. uh, I eat, you know, ridiculous, ridiculous amounts of Ezekiel, you know, right. uh, and, uh, uh, and I just, you know, I feel, uh, better, you know, when I'm, when I'm in that groove, right. um, uh, and I'm a, you know, I'm a vitamin whore, you uh-huh. know, I, you know, I'm, I, I, you know, they, I, you know, there's debate about the effectiveness of that, but, uh, you know, I take vitamins three times a day and, uh, um, and I'm very aware of, uh, you know, uh, uh, all my nutritional levels, you know, like I do blood work every two months with my guide, you know, to see, like I, like I'm, here's what I, here's the good thing about where I'm at with it all now. I no longer, 
Like it's so easy for me to live in the vague, you know, just sort of like, la, 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 you know, yeah. and I don't do that anymore. Uh -huh. Meaning like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm aware of where I'm at pretty much. Even, even the stuff I don't like, mm -hmm. I stay aware of, you know what I mean? Right. You're not in denial, like that you have some, you know, uh, where your blood pressure is at and your cholesterol and all that kind of shit. <laughs> like you're staring it in the face, but yes. I, that, I, that's a, it's a, as somebody who struggled with your relationship with food and having a kind of a healthy, you know, handshake with it. Um, it's a tricky tightrope walk because if you get too into that kind of stuff, then you're back into like obsession. Yes. You know? Yeah. I don't know. I'll tell you this story and, and I don't, I think you might know this or maybe not, but, um, you know, I, uh, for the longest time, if I was not plant-based, I was pescatarian. Right. And, uh, I worked out, four to five times a week, you know, my, you know, I've always, you know, I'm always obsessing about my weight, but I'm, you know, I'm, I was in a fairly healthy range and, um, and my blood pressure has always been on the high, high side because, uh, it's hereditary, right? My dad had high blood, my dad stroked had a, when he was in his fifties, right? Mm -hmm. So it's something I'm just aware of. And I've never found, like I was on different medications, uh, uh, and, uh, I just didn't like them. So I avoided that, you know, I just tried to like do it to, with diet and, but my MD was, you know, she was, you know, like it was getting to the point where she was worried. Right. So she, I did my routine checkup and, you know, uh, got on the treadmill and, and did the EKG and, and, uh, and she saw something on the EKG that she knew was like nothing but used it as an excuse to send me to a cardiologist, right? Uh -huh. And said, you should go see the cardiologist. And, and it was basically so that the cardiologist would scare me into taking blood pressure meds, right? She was like yeah. teaming up on me. Right. You know what I mean? Like to get like, you know, so I go to the cardiologist and with Kate and I did the, the big, the two big, you know, the test and you're in the, the, the roto thing. And they, they do the calcium. Yeah. yeah. All the whole, uh -huh. the whole deal. Right. And I was like, literally they're like, just give me every <coughs> fucking test you have. Right. So we can see that everything's fine and I can get the fuck out of here. And, uh, so we get into the office, right. And we're sitting down with my cardiologist, uh, who now is like, you know, my best friend. And, uh, <laughs> he looks really worried. He's like, um, can you, I had something come up. Can you guys, uh, come back after lunch and why don't you go across the street, grab lunch. And so we're like, oh, okay. And then we're at lunch. We're like, wow, I wonder what happened. Like, he looked really worried. Like, you know, and completely clueless that when we get back, that who he was worried about was me. And that a major artery in my heart was like 90% clogged. Right. And had the LAD, uh, lower. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The widow maker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he it had nothing to do with, uh, um, diet, mm -hmm. it was completely hereditary and probably started happening 15, 20 years ago, the breakdown of it, right? Yeah. This it's over time. This is exactly what happened to, to Kevin Smith. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, uh, so, uh, we go back to his office and he shows me the pictures, right? And I'm just like, I'm like numb. I'm like, it's like, who, who are you, who are you talking about? You know? I'm the guy that, you know, I work out six days a week. I'm, you know, I eat, you know, and, uh, so I went and, you know, they do, uh, I had a stent put in. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but my reaction to that, and this is a little, you know, this is, you know, what kind of cloth I'm cut from. Right. My reaction to that was fuck this. Right. And that's when I started smoking. Mm -hmm. That's when I started eating meat. I, my reaction to it was, well, if this, if, if, if doing all this has nothing to do with the quality of life and my health, what the fuck is the point? Yeah. Forget it. Forget it. And that's uh, so interesting. And I started smoking and, you know, so the whole time I was doing bastard in the UK, you know, I got up to a pack and a half a day. I knew that you were smoking. Yeah. And I, and I was like, what are you doing? Like, maybe he's just stressed out. I did not know that you had a stent put in. Though. Yeah. But that was my response to it. Right. right. Not like, oh you're my like, God. Because in your mind, you're like, I've been a good boy. Exactly. And this is what I get. Right. So like, fuck you. I can't eat. Right. I can't be any healthier than I already am. Mm -hmm. So 
fuck it. Right. But those plaques, you know, started when you were seven years old. You oh, know, yeah. It was like it's a lifetime of building up. Exactly. That point, exactly. You know? But and um, the truth is you can, and I'm sure your cardiologist has told you this, like you can reverse that stuff. Yes. You know? Yes. And thank God you had a stent put in and you didn't have like a massive coronary. Nothing. There were, it yeah. was asymptomatic, you know, mm-hmm. until it's not. Yeah. You know, and uh, so it was so surreal. And that was, you know, that's the kind of cloth I'm cut from. That's how I dealt with it. And yeah, I'm not surprised knowing <laughs> you. You know, it's just like pushing back on everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you're, it, at times, your own worst enemy. I, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and the whole time I'm doing it, completely aware on some level mm-hmm. what was happening. Self-sabotage. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then, and then, of course, you know, I try to quit and I'm like, oh, this is what they mean when they can't. <laughs> a new addiction. Yeah, you know, you know. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and uh, and it's not like I, you know, started smoking and dropped fifty pounds. You know, like none of that happened. But you know, the whole time I was in London, I was smoking, and then I came back, and you know, it took me about six months to ultimately let it go, yeah. and uh, and then I did, and then you know, my lifestyle shifted and got back to you know what I knew was not just the way to live, it was how I lived, you know, and uh, which is, you know, where I'm sort of at now, right? But there was a two and a half year period where I was like, what's the point, yeah. you know? And uh, uh, and I don't recommend that to, uh, to anyone. Yeah, not a good know? idea. I'm glad you came back from that though, man. You know, you're a good dude. We want you to stick around. You know, and it's so weird because it's like I never had any doubt that – that's how I, you know, it's not like I thought that's who I am now. Like but it's I, that, it's that, it's that distinction between like intellectually, you know, yeah. you're, you have total awareness of what you're doing and you know, it's not good for you. Mm-hmm. And yet what is that thing that's compelling you to like walk down that dark alley? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's that, uh, you know, and who you're, you know, it's that, you know, fuck you. Mm-hmm. But the only person you're saying fuck you to yeah, is, your, is yourself. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. It's sort of like who you who you define this here? person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, you know, and God, you know, my and, and my wife Kate was, you know, like she saw all this happening and you know, uh uh and you know, we were we had our own stuff going on at the time. And so it was just this, you know, it was this sort of, you know, bizarro Kurt for mm-hmm. like two years, you know what I mean? And uh uh, and still, you know, navigating around some of that. But uh, uh, but as far as, you know, health stuff, it's, you know, it's really been, you know, it's been a little bit over a year. And uh, uh, and uh, and that's where, you know, the conversation we first had when I when I saw you today was about weight. And, you know, mm-hmm. like I knew when I was qu- like quitting that I was going to pack on weight. Mm-hmm. And that's when I would I sort of change things up in terms of my workout and and uh, and uh, if I was going to put on weight, at least I wanted to put it on in the right places. Muscle, you know? yeah. yeah. You know. And uh, change up the beard geography a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> you know, that's that was right. actually that was actually for some acting. I, yeah, I did. Okay. And, you know. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, so let's work up to that. I mean, all right. So so you kind of bail on Rutgers. You go to New York City. You're studying Meisner. You're doing like you know, off Broadway theater, right? Stuff like that. Yes, bad off Broadway. And then you <laughs> like you move to LA, but then you go to grad school in in northern Illinois. Right, like, right. you know, what's what's going on? Like you when did you first come out to LA? I I first came out to LA in the mid eighties, late eighties uh-huh. as an actor, you know, and uh uh and pursued acting out here and 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 that's sort of when um like I didn't get sober but I knew, you know, uh, I had started going to OA at that mm. point and, and I was aware of, you know, what some of my demons were. You know, like uh-huh. I was, I was, things were becoming, you know, I was, things were becoming sort of getting into focus. And, uh, um, and I came out here, uh, originally I came out here at an, uh, to LA at an odd time. It was the first writer strike back in the eighties and it was just in like the, Really bad Came out timing. Right when there's nothing to do. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, and then I talked to you know my mentor uh, studying in New York was this woman Catherine Gately and and uh, you know uh, and so I ultimately went back to New York 
to study with her to teach, right? Because mm-hmm. I thought, like, this is really what I love to do. Um, and if I can't do it as an actor, you know, this was a technique that really uh, spoke to me that I understood on a really sort of visceral level. And perhaps, you know, I can I can teach it and uh, and then direct theater. And that was sort of the, the plan coming back to New York in the early 90s. Um, and then, you know, I uh, was with Catherine and, and then Catherine was offered a uh, sort of master teaching position. Uh, at uh, um, uh, Northern Illinois University, uh, uh, about a half hour outside of Chicago. And and she, you know, uh, really, she sort of took me under her wing and took me along as, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, so I went out there um, as a student, you know, but really with the focus of learning the tech, you know, and it's the technique I had studied with her, right? So it was about, you know, taking the technique again, really looking at it through the eyes of being a, t- a teacher and a director. Um, and, uh, you know, and I did that for, uh, it was, it's a three-year program, and I, I was in DeKalb, Illinois for two years. Uh, and then, you know, the rest of it I did pretty much through, um, uh, through, uh, um, independent studies, uh-huh. right? And so was the dream then that you would go into academia or that you'd become yeah. a theater director? Yeah, the dream then was like, oh, this is, I'm you know, gonna teacher. I'm going to get into academia, uh-huh. not realizing that, first of all, the arts budgets in across the board in all schools were shrinking and being a white male was, uh, was not, you know, high on the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the registry in terms of who was being hired. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and really became aware that if I wanted to do that, most likely it would be like, you know, some community college out in, you know, right. Grizzly Point, you know, wherever. But did you feel like you couldn't go back to New York and, and or L.A. and like take a stab at, at the acting thing? Did, like, did you get your ass handed to you or do you just feel like you were there at the wrong time? Like, what was your mindset then? I think at that point, I really... You know, I loved acting, but I think I really, um, uh, you know, I was really focused on, you know, uh, teaching and directing. Uh-huh. Like I, I, it's not that I didn't like acting and I, and obviously I did a lot of it when I was in grad school, mm-hmm. right? It's part of the program. And, but uh, it really was, you know, wanting to, you know, basically, you know, how do I make a career out of the arts, out of the thing that I love, uh-huh. right? Uh, and felt like, you know, as much as I loved acting, being an actor was too, you know, uh, my practical, you know, pragmatic brain couldn't sit with, you know, uh, or couldn't trust that. Lack of control. Lack of control and that I could make a living out of that. And yet, so if there was something, you know, I could do that sort of, tapped into that love, but was a little bit more secure, mm-hmm. that made sense. Yeah. Uh, so that was the you plan. a little bit of dad talking to you in the back of your head on that one? Oh, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of dad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what was their, like, what was their perspective on, on you, like, pursuing a career in the arts? I think they, I think they realized that it's, uh, uh, it's what I wanted to do, uh, they were very supportive of me going back and getting my degree. Mm-hmm. You know, they always were. Being, well, something they can understand. Yeah. You know? And the understood yeah. like, oh, okay, here's a, you know, it was much, it was pragmatic. It wasn't quite as um, elusive as trying to be, uh, you know, a TV star or, an, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. And uh, um, so they were supportive of it. And, uh, uh, and, uh, but, you know, it took a while for them to, to get there. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but then, um, you know, what ended up happening is I, I, I come out of that circumstance and, um, uh, it was a great experience. Like some of, you know, really, you know, some of the most satisfying years of my life in terms of the art. Right. Uh-huh. And, uh, and really immersing myself in a way that I was never able to do in New York when I was, you know, trying to survive and being an actor, right? Uh, you know, exposed to such great dramatic literature in a way I'd never been exposed to before and just really kind of opened up my mind uh, and exposed me to, you know, some really, some really um, 
great writers and and uh, playwrights. Who were your guys? Um, I liked the uh, surreal, you know, the uh, the surrealists, you know, um, uh, like uh, uh, Genet and Ibsen, and mm. you know, all those uh, crazy Russians, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, uh, the the uh, it was sort of like the ones that spoke to me, you know. Uh, as well, you know, I'm a huge Eugene O'Neill fan, you know. Um, so, um, uh, but those, you know, the 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 really damaged ones. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's surprising. Uh, um, and uh, you know, it's like I love those. I love those. Uh, uh, the Russians, you know, like Chekhov, where mm-hmm. you know. On face value, you can read it and be like, oh, my God, and then realize, well, wait a minute, this is a comedy. <laughs> then I have to go back and be like, oh, uh-huh. you know. Uh, but um, uh, so, uh, you know, for me, it was, you know, uh, uh, just such a, an amazing uh, experience. But then ultimately, uh, I went back. I had met my first wife at that point and went back to L.A. And the plan was maybe to uh, – uh, to teach privately, right? Because mm-hmm. I realized, you know, I just didn't have the, like, I, I just didn't want to be like in some community college in yeah. anywhere in New USA, right? Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I, you know, I had a friend out here who, or a colleague who was, had her, her own studio and maybe I could, you know, s- you set up a shingle and, and sort of have that be who, you know, how to do this. Um, I started writing in grad school a little bit and, uh, and then, uh, um, through a series of events began writing out here and, uh, uh, and at some point that really, um, pulled focus, you know? It's weird that, that you had to kind of go through everything, you know, all these other disciplines around the world of writing before Mm -hmm. you kind of hit that bullseye for yourself. Yeah, it really is. And I, and it's interesting because I, uh, it was a very circuitous, you know, but what I realized is that everything I did up to that, um, not just life experience, but, you know, academically Mm -hmm. and training wise really, um, created a unique set of tools that gave me what ultimately became my voice and that any other way it probably wouldn't have happened. Now it's hard to, you know, and the only way that can happen is to let it happen and then look at it in hindsight. Right. But, uh, you know, that became really clear to me that, yeah, it took me a long time to get here and, you know, when I first got my first gig on The Shield, I was 10 years older than everybody, mm-hmm. you know. And, uh, you know, but at that point, I, you know, my trajectory happened fairly quickly. And it's almost like I, you know, it's like all that stuff was sort of just lying in wait. Yeah, you know and, I mean? and it got plugged into like just this sort of ultimate – project for you to sink your teeth in. Yeah. Like it couldn't have been more kind of creatively, creatively aligned, yes. you know, with wh- where your instincts were coming from. I, I, I mean, were you aware of that in the time or you're just, you're probably still trying to figure out what your voice is. Right? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's like your first gig. It was, it was. You and know, I, it's so crazy. And I just remember, uh, I remember at my, my wedding to Kate, uh, that, uh, Sean said a few words or, and we had it at our, our house and at the time in Los Feliz mm-hmm. and, and, uh, uh, and I always remember the Sean, Sean being the creator, Sean the Ryan, mm-hmm. uh, who's a creator and who hired me. And at that point, I think we were in like the second or third or the third or fourth season. We were, you know, into it. And, uh, you know, Sean described me as like everyone else because of the world was so sort of dark and, you know, uh, you know, you had the, go to those places you don't necessarily like to go to that everybody else sort of, you know, took off a shoe and dipped their toe in and that I basically stripped down naked and dove in head first, <laughs> yeah. right? Which, um, which I, uh-huh. I, you know, which is kind of true, right? Right. And uh, because it was, it was familiar water for me, right? It was that sort of offbeat, kind of dark looking at the world through, you know, uh, a lens that 
you're not supposed to look through, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and it really was, you know, it was so fortuitous that that was my first show and not like, you know, and not that this isn't, you know, like network TV didn't have great shows, but if I had, you know, if I wasn't allowed to like be who I was and someone tried to wrangle me through a different filter, you know, my career would probably be much different. Right. I mean, what if, what if you ended up writing for Ali McBeal or right. something like that? Right, I mean, right, it's like, right. it, you know, the fact that you ended up on the shield, I mean, it's so <laughs> it's, it's like almost universally divine yeah. because, and the timing is so important as well. Because I think it's hard for people to understand, like, this is before Breaking Bad. This uh -huh. is before, like, you know, this whole, like, era of the anti-hero hadn't really... I mean, The Sopranos, I guess, you know, Tony Soprano was mm -hmm. an anti-hero. But, like, that fully fleshed out, like, arc over many seasons of of this, you know, really palpable, visceral anti-hero um, hadn't occurred yet. And Vic Mackey really, like, brought that to life. And you, you're sort of credited with writing, like, a lot of the gnarliest, you know, scenes that transpire in that, in that series. Yeah. I, uh, you know, um, Sean was such a great mentor and, uh, and really, you know, you know, cause I'm, you know, at the time I'm brand new, right. So I'm being driven, you know, creatively, you know, in, inspired, but, you know, personally, um, and emotionally I'm terrified, right. Cause it's like, it's the first time I've had anything real and I'm so afraid that it's going to go away. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mousetrap ready, ready to spring, you know? So I was really bullish and, and, uh, you know, incredibly proprietary over, you know, what I wanted to do. And, um, and, uh, you know, and, sh and a lot of showrunners I think would have, you know, been intimidated by that. And and Sean was just a smart guy and in and, and and intuitive enough to sort of, you know, rein me in when I needed to be reined in, but for the most part just sort of put up the bumpers that took me in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And uh uh and really, you know, it's why I feel um I have a lot of you know, I stayed on that show till the end, right? Yeah. And uh seven, I, seven seasons, right? Yeah. And I really feel like, you know, I was able to uh, contribute at least tonally to the show. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ultimately it's Sean's vision in terms of story, but that, uh, you know, I, I felt like I was really able to find my voice, you know, mm -hmm. within the confines of that, uh, of that world and that character. And, you know, and a lot of people wouldn't allowed me to do that mm -hmm. uh, or would have been intimidated by that and tried to shut me down or be threatened by it. And Sean, you know, was just, uh, you know, really uh, smart enough and, you know, and, and a, enough of a mentor to sort of nurture it and, you know, set right. me on fire when, in, 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 at the right times. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And maybe have a, uh, more than a few conversations behind closed doors with other people. Like, Perhaps. I know he's a pain in the ass, <laughs> but like, there's something there. You got to let me work with this guy. I'll, 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 you know, try to make it palatable for everyone else. <laughs> you know, um, how does it work? Like, I'm always amazed when I watch, you know, a program of that caliber and knowing a little bit about how production works, like it's just amazing that anything good ever gets made. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see something that's really good and knowing like the time constraints and the pressures and like all these personalities that have to come together and conspire to like create something, right. you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm baffled by it and I'm amazed. And I'm, and I'm always wondering like, how does a writing, how does a writer's room work? Like you're in, I just have this vision of like a bunch of people sitting around a conference room table, like eating Chinese food <laughs> at three in the morning and right, getting right. into arguments. Uh, some of it. Uh, I think comedy works very different than, than drama, you know, I think there's a lot of that happens in comedy. It's a lot, uh -huh. you know, there's a lot more personalities in the room um, because you're, you're doing story, but you're also telling jokes, right? So you, you're, you're servicing, you know, uh, uh, two masters. Uh, for drama, you know, um, y you know, you, anywhere from five to seven writers usually. And uh, you have one writer that runs the room and, uh, and the showrunner, you know, the way I work is... Uh, and in and you know really uh from sons on um you know I'll have one writer that kind of runs the room for me right mm -hmm. and will you know 
sort of uh, steer steer story in a certain direction, and then I'll come in and I'll weigh in uh, on you know what what works, what doesn't work, what we need, and you know uh, and plug in you know uh, at different points of the day. You know, but prior to that, you, there must be some sort of you know meeting of the minds where everyone gets together, and you kind of have to break the arc of the season, right? Like, okay, this is these are the things that are going to transpire over these ten or thirteen right. hours. Yeah, I mean, the way I work is, uh, you know, there'll be, uh, you know, I'll have a a general arc that, uh, like for Mayans, right, there's for this first season, there's a, you know, there's a a sort of a broad arc that I want to service in terms of the show, like where it starts and kind of uh, where I want our hero to, or anti-hero to land, uh, and at the end of that season, at the end of the that end season, of like if you could imagine seven years of that show, um, you know, I had a bigger arc for Sons that wasn't necessarily beat for beat of where the show was going, but a great, but a sense of, um, you know, broad strokes where I wanted it to go. Like I knew I wanted Jax to be president and, you know, um, and I have some of that for Mayans, but perhaps not quite as much. And I think that's a good thing because what I learned on Sons is that, you know, I'd have these sort of general arcs or these concepts for each season. And then I learned that the looser I held on to them, the better the season was, right? So I used them really as catalysts, right, and and mile markers. But then I don't – if the story is going in a different direction, I, tr- I don't try to bend it uh-huh. to like a, a, a pre-existing idea if it's going in a different direction, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's really, you know, uh, uh, the, way, uh, the way I'll work. So, you know, for the Mayans, I'll, I go in with the writers and I sort of pitch out – Generally, where I want it to land, you know, and um, and then we'll have um, a sense of all right, you know, maybe in, by episode four I want this to happen, mm-hmm. and then by episodes we'll, we're doing uh, the pilot plus nine, right? Where that you know, so episode four, and then by episode eight, and then you know, so by the end we're we're at this place, right? Mm-hmm. But it's really it's you know it's sort of broad and. Uh, um, and then sometimes I'll break out all the board with episodes and sort of where I want some of those bigger moments to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, and then, you know, I let, you know, we'll come up each episode, you have, you know, an A story, a main story. And then usually there's a, something that's more character driven. That's a, a B story, right. sometimes even a C story, like mm-hmm. a little runner, that's two or three beats. And, um, and then, uh, you know, but that uh, that sort of moves you forward towards some of those mile markers, you uh-huh. know. But I, I've learned that, you know, the more I – more open I am to it going someplace else, you know, as long as I don't lose the vision of the show, you know, the better the show is. Right, rather than being rigid on some idea that you had previously that's yeah. kind of at odds with where it's naturally flowing. Yeah, and, yeah. and just like, you know, to find like a great character beat, right, or a, a, a narrative beat that's really, you know, that speaks to the characters in the world, you know, that may send the trajectory mm-hmm. going in a different direction. And, you know, not that you can't ultimately land where you want to land, but you may have two or three points along the way. And rather than bending it to try to hit those, yeah. you find, you know, you, you trust that if you continue to do what you're doing, you'll, you, you know, you'll find what you're supposed to pass through to, yeah. to get to that point, you know? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. You, you had said earlier, you know, by virtue of this grad school experience that, that, uh, you learned that, you know, you learned these tools for how to tell stories mm-hmm. or how to be a storyteller. So like, what are those tools? Like, what is your perspective on how, you know, what makes you the storyteller that you are? What are the guiding principles of that? Um, that's a great question. I think, uh, uh, you know, for me in, in grad school, it was being exposed to, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's not, it's nothing that you can then like kind of rip out and go, Oh, I'm going to use that 
uh-huh. knowledge here, right? Kurt Sutter's five tips. For- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but I think what I what I learned was um, here, here's here's where where my um, you know my narrative and uh, and liter- and uh, my expose exposure to you know to dramatic literature, classic dramatic literature, or you know uh, the poetic realists were obviously my favorite, right? Where that knowledge and and then my acting sort of kind of um, uh, worked hand in hand is that you know I always had a really good sense for. Um, uh, bullshit moments, right? Like if I was, it was made me a a pretty good director and a pretty good teacher, right? Is that I could usually know when actors were not connected or their, the moment didn't feel real. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so what I was able, what I realized I was able to do is take that skill and apply it to how I write dialogue so that I, you know, I'll, you know, it's why I'm not a showrunner that gives actors freedom with language, like the line, no, no the, improvising on your set. Yeah. You know, the words on the page are the words I want to hear. And if they don't work, we'll figure it out together. But like, I spend a lot of time and energy in putting the right words in the, in, mm-hmm. in, in the character's mouths. Right. And, uh, uh, so, uh, I realized that ultimately that skill was very translatable to writing, you know, like I can hear, you know, I'll, when I write, you know, the magic for me is, you know, I'll be alone in my office and, you know, I'll hear that conversation, you know, and I'll, you know, I'll be in it and I'll feel it and, you know, you know, be weeping at the parts where those characters are weeping or angry. Like I can, I can take the emotional journey of the characters. Yeah. You're like an emotional cipher. Yeah. And I think that's what allows me to, at the very least, write authentic dialogue, you know, and, uh, and then, you know, and then I have to be collaborative in terms of letting my director have an interpretation of that and having the actor have their interpretation. But ultimately, as long as those moments are, you know, steer the story in the right direction, then, you know, I'm doing my job. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I forget what your question was, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. I think you answered it. I, 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 the follow up to that would really be, you know, what is what is your like practice of writing? Like, are you 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 have like a routine? Do you have like a methodology for how you approach these things? Like, it, a, are you a late night guy? It's it's like if I have ten days to write a script or rewrite a script, like I'll get my writer's draft and mm-hmm. and you know I wish I had the ability to do this and and I may. You know, this is a, I'm, in fact, this weekend I get my first draft from, uh, you know, I wrote the first episode, which is done and, and I'm getting the next episode that two other writers have written. And, uh, you know, um, for the most part, I always sort of do a page one rewrite, right? And it's not, has nothing to do with the writer's inability to understand or interpret the story. It's just, I, you know, I kind of have to, hear the voices in my head. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so, um, which is really, uh, uh, my process, Do you know what I mean? So are you actually acting it out in your office? Pretty, are you saying the, the words out loud? Pretty much. Like yeah. I will play out the scene and at least the emotionality of it, you know? Um, and, uh, uh, and then, uh, but you know, and so I'll, I'll get that, uh, you know, I'll get that, Um, you know, so if I, so if I have 10 days to do a rewrite, you know, the first six are usually procrastination, Uh you know, and then the last four hour of television (laughs) in four days. Jesus. Uh, uh, so, you know, I mean, I mean, that's true and it's not true, meaning Uh that I was thinking about it. Yes. It's it's it's, like percolating. Yeah. And I'll, and you know, and I write everything out on a, I have a huge whiteboard in my Mm -hmm. office and, uh, uh, it covers, the entire wall and, you know, and I'll, and the story will be all beat out, but then I'll usually have, you know, I'll just have like, you know, it looks like serial killer yeah, yeah. scroll on the uh-huh. side of it in terms of like, oh, okay, that's what that beat is. And so that when I, when I'm ready to actually sit down and put something on a page, you know, 
there's been work done yeah. that is a lot of times, you know, whether I'm driving or, you know, I'll, uh, it'll, it'll sort of come together in, in, in process. And you've done it so much for so many years, I would imagine you can kind of trust, like, even if you're stuck, like, okay, you know, I've been, I've been here before. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. I always, I do. And then I don't, you know what I mean? In fact, this last, what do you do when you're stuck? Well, this last script, it's funny. I, I finished it and, you know, there were a lot of changes that I made, not necessarily big arcs in terms that was, that were going to fuck up, you know, the narrative component, right? Where it's going, but just changes and, and I'll find stuff that I'll be like, oh, what if this happened? Mm. That, (laughs) that usually like, I won't share with anybody until they read the script and they'll go, oh, (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, and not that I'm going to go in that direction, not that I'm keeping it from anybody. It'll just happen in in process. Right. And I, I've learned to embrace that stuff and and some of it works and some, but a lot of it does. Right. So, um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll be in process with all that. And, um, (laughs) you know, and, and, you know, I, you know, I just sound like a, if you walk by my office, it just sounds like a you know, ranting lunatic. Yeah, like a lunatic, right? And uh-huh. and and acting the scenes out and and having those moments. But I'll, you know, you know, out of that, uh, I forget what your question was. Sorry. It's just like, how do you work your way out of being stuck? Like, oh, you know, right. oh writer's block. Like, right. is that something you experience? Do you think that's a bullshit? Or like, how do you, yeah, how do you, I, how do you push through moments where it's not coming to you? It's not bullshit. I think my blocks aren't so much in terms of story as much as nuance, right? Like, you know, in this episode, uh, and breaking the third, fourth episode, Mm -hmm. you know, I had an awareness about what I thought the arc might be and realized that, oh, I have to soften that, right? And, and open it up more to be more, you know, to be a bigger point of view. And, uh, so then I can go back you know, we're going to do pilot reshoots, right? So right. I can go back into some of those scenes and allow for that to happen, right? So you can plant that seed. I can that plant, will yeah. Germinate in episode four. Or whatever. Uh, uh-huh. So it, that's sort of, uh, you know, it allows, you know, there's there's room, you know, there's room to do that. Um, uh, but I, you know, uh, a lot of that stuff is, um, you know, it's not so much block as in. How do I, you know, knowing where we're going, how do I shape things to lay track to that, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and without compromising what it's supposed to be mm-hmm. or without like leaning into, you know, hey, we're going someplace else, mm-hmm. like finding becoming the, too distracted. Yeah. Right? Like finding the balance of that. Uh, it's and, like a weird alchemy. It right? really is. It really is. And you still you'll find you'll shoot this stuff. You know, and it's always, you know, it's always different when, you know, you, you get the cut and you see the actor's interpretation. Yeah. Well, there's all, what's on the page and then you're there shooting it and yeah. you're like, well, that doesn't look what I thought, uh, <laughs> I thought it was going to look yeah. like, right? And, you know. And then there's what you shot and trying to piece that together in the editing room. Yeah. So you, you, and, and, you know, I've learned to embrace that and, mm-hmm. and, and, and really, you know, revel in, in, you know, what it becomes and and look, sometimes it doesn't work, and you have to go back and and sort of assert uh, a point of view that wasn't covered to yeah. protect story, you know, um, or character. And um, but for the most part, I really try to let it be a breathing, living entity, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and and let other people's creative point of view inform the show, you know. Uh, uh, in terms of interpretation and, you know, it's, it's the magic of, you'll do a scene. Uh, let's see, what can I use for an example? Like, uh, on sons, right. Um, you'll do a scene with characters that never organically perhaps would come together in a scene. Like, uh, I remember writing a scene for Jimmy Smith's and the only way to get him there to, to, uh, location was with, um, uh, uh, the Unser character, right. Uh-huh. You know, so, uh, um, putting him in a car with that character, I was like, all right, what are those guys talking about? And then I realized, oh fuck, they both love the same woman. Right. Mm-hmm. So what is that scene going to be like? So you, you then have to go, well, let's see, I have to service 
where it's going, right? So, uh, you know, so let me, you know, I have, there's a, you know, there's exposition I have to try to lay in. Right. And then, but then you have point of view, right? And then, you know, you give that to actors like Dayton Kelly and Jimmy Smits and you watch it and it's fucking gold, right? Because they bring all of their understanding of who the characters were. And then you think, all right, I just got to keep writing scenes for those guys, mm-hmm. you know? So that's an example of like, yes, it serves the story, but you have actors and, and a director that bring their interpretation of it and you go, oh just man, that's, that's magic, thing. right? Mm-hmm. And, and then you, you, you write to that. Mm-hmm. It's really why I don't, you know, and, and the nature of, of, of production for FX is, you know, allows for this, but it's why I don't like to get too far ahead of production. You know, in fact, I, I cut it way too close towards the end. And, but, uh, you know, because I like to be able to get feedback uh, from cuts as I'm still writing the mm-hmm. show, because you'll like, oh, wow, that, that really works, right? So how can I, how can I service that you know, and plug right. it into the story because right, right, that's right. A, those two, like... So you're writing as you're shooting. Yes, yeah, always, wow. yeah. So then I would imagine that that would, that, would, that would make it more important for you to shoot as much in sequence as you possibly could episodically, right? Yeah, you can do... Well, I would... I never... We don't block shoot episodes, which a lot of shows do, which means you'll have the scripts and then you'll block shoot oh, like in every, one location one set up for the next four episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't mean like that, but I, I mean, obviously you can't shoot sequentially, but right. But right. if you're going to want to be writing along the way, because what happens is going to inform what happens next right. to the extent that you could control that, I would imagine would be something you would want. Yeah. But it's hard, you know, for the most part, I really don't see cuts until they're done. Like I'm not a guy that really, you know, I don't really watch dailies. It's more like what's going to happen next episode. Yeah. How's that going to uh, play out? I, you know, the only time I watch dailies is if like there's something we're not sure about or if, I, if it's a new actor and I want to see what the dynamic is. Um, but what ends up happening is, you know, I'll see it, you know, a cut of it fairly soon, right? That allows me to then, you know, maybe there's a, you know whether it's the next episode or the the episode after that. After that, um, it's a, it's in proximity enough to what I've witnessed mm-hmm. to be able to incorporate mm-hmm. that in. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it happened early on, Sons with uh, um, with uh, Juice and Tig. Like putting those two together was like comedy gold, right? Right. So then you're just like, how do I, how do, you know, how do I service that? How do I exploit like that? Rosencrantz and Gildan. Oh, absolutely, you know, kind of thing, absolutely, right? yeah. Um, all right. So, so with the shield, you work your way up, like every year you kind of get promoted so that by the time we're at season seven, you're an executive producer on the show. Um, did you feel, and then you go right into Sons of Anarchy, your first Mm -hmm. show that you created. Um, I mean, I, you know, that show was such a massive success. I mean, it was a cultural phenomenon. Is it still like the most successful show that FX has ever had? I mean, it's crazy. Uh it's yeah. hard to judge that because the times and the dynamics and the mm. rules changed. Um, Whatever. It was you know, huge. Yes. It All was, right. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, looking back on that, uh, you know, I can't, you couldn't have predicted that. I mean, what was your, uh, you know, your, your anticipation, your expectation, like going into that experience? The, so the shield or the sun? No, or going sons? into suns. And like, what did you take from Sean? Right. Like, what did you learn specifically from working under Sean for seven years mm. that you then put to work on suns? Pretty much everything, you know, I, I, everything I learned in that room in terms of telling story and breaking story, you know, I went to school on, on, uh, on Sean and Glenn Mazzara and that writer's room, uh, you know, and, uh, um, and learned, you know, learned how to tell, uh, you know, episodic stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't quite know, you know, by the time I was done on the, sh- you know, what ended up happening is, you know, I, my last season on the shield, rather than taking a money bump, I took a time bump. Because I was, you know, I knew I was developing this show. Mm -hmm. And I said to Sean, look, I don't want to raise, but I want to be able to throw a couple days a week at this other project. Um, And Sean agreed. And, uh, you know, so I could start to segue into Sons. And uh, um, because what I ultimately found out was that I thought Sons was going to air 
when the shield finished and what they decided they wanted to do was air them at the same time. Mm. So that first season of Sons aired, you know, uh, you know, with the last season of the shield. Uh, I didn't remember that. So that was, yeah. it was kind of nuts, right. In terms of wow. time, you uh-huh. know, because suddenly what I thought, you know, was X amount of time got just crunched. And so not only was I doing it for the first time, I was sort of doing it with a gun to my head. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and 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 you can only imagine how I react when I have a gun to my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I saw how you reacted more than a few times. Uh, um, uh, that was your coming out party. Yeah, it really was. You couldn't like, you know, I'm just pretty. a guy in a writer's room on the shield. Like you're a member of a team there. And now it's all you. Yeah. Your face. Uh, but it was, you know, and and look, the, uh, the network tried to protect me. And, uh, you know, they brought in a, a guy to sort of help me run that first season who, you know, I ultimately, you know, within three episodes, you know, crushed him and stamped him <laughs> in, into the ground because he didn't get the show. Right. Yeah, okay. And, and he was a talented dude, but didn't uh-huh. quite know what I was trying to do. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and then, you know, so it was, it was really, it was crunchy, man, you know, and, and look, you know, it's all fear, right? Uh-huh. So I'm not the kind of guy that, you know, I don't, I don't fade with fear, Right. I, I set myself on fire and run at you. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, it was, it was bumpy, man. It was really, it was really bumpy. And, uh, uh, and, you know, it took us, you know, and we, uh, I just, you know, we premiered and we were up against, I remember, you know, the night of the show premiered sons was the night Sarah Palin spoke. So we lost like our, our, you know, who, who can predict that, mm-hmm. right? So the numbers, you know, and that's when people were, before people were TiVoing everything and recording mm-hmm. everything and on the DVR, they were actually showing up in front of a TV and, mm-hmm. and we got, you know, we got crushed and, uh, you know, but then, you know, we slowly, you know, we, you know, we basically got hammered that first episode, but then we, it was just this sort of frozen rope for a while. And then by episode six or seven, we started to bump up so that by the time we got to the end of that first season, you know, we were doing respectable numbers and everybody felt good about where it was going. And uh, But it was an organic build, you know? Yes. And, and I think yeah. what's, what's kind of maybe not unique, but seems to, unique to me is that there's this like, you know, super rabid fan base that this show developed. Like it's a very... I don't know how the demographic breaks down, but it's kind of like a, you know, when you see it and Mm -hmm. these people, like, I just know from like your Twitter following or whenever you've retweeted anything, I I get a glimpse at like these incredibly passionate people who just like adore this program. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what do you, so what do you do? What do you think you tapped into that connected? Um, You know, it's interesting. I, I had to sort of shake out, all of that, uh, and look at it again, you know, when I was getting notes on, uh, uh, on the, on this pilot, uh, for Mayans and, uh, and I realized, you know, we ended up doing a massive, like, and we ended up doing the same thing we did on Sons. We did major recasting and sh- reshot like 90% of the pilot. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, I remember that it was Scott Glenn right. uh, was the first guy and you had to reshoot the whole thing. Right. Uh, and we sort of did the same on, on Mayans mm-hmm. and, uh, and I didn't, du- I made the decision not to direct the second pilot just because, um, um, a lot of reasons, but I felt like, um, I was too divided, you know, I thought it would be a good idea, but ultimately I, you know, uh, I felt that it was, you know, it was it was difficult for me to take off the producer hat while I was directing, and that's ultimately um, a shackle, you know. So, um, but uh, uh, you know what I was what I was able to do is um, uh, is 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 take. Um, is is sort of I had the opportunity in 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 the in the reshoot to sort of take a step back and look at what I was doing that wasn't organic, and what I realized is that I was for for an example, we had a uh, a character uh, that was sort of a matriarch character, and 
I realized that I was trying so hard to not make her Gemma Mm -hmm. that ultimately she was two-dimensional and it had nothing to do with the actress. Um, It was just, you know, uh, uh, I realized what the mistake was, you know, and, and even having that conversation with John Landgraft afterwards in terms of, you know, they tested the pilot and, uh, and it was a limited testing, and they only brought in Suns fans to mm-hmm. test it. And you know, which is a double-edged sword, right? You have a you have a uh, uh, you know a friendly room, but a friendly room with a lot of a lot opinions, of expectations, yeah, and too. a lot of opinions, yeah. right? And 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 I had to remind John, you know, because it was about you know the matriarch character, and you know, and and really reminding John that you know we didn't come into Suns thinking we were going to get eventually half our audience would be women, right? It was a male coming off the shield. Mm-hmm. We, were, we were shooting for that male demographic. It was, you know, uh, and uh, we didn't say, like, let's create these really strong female characters to broaden the show base, right? And uh, so we had no expectation of that, and that just happened organically. And it was, quite frankly, it was the nature of that world, right? Mm-hmm. That women not, you know, uh, unlike... Uh, La Cosa Nostra, the women in, in the MC world, you know, they have a function. They hold the whole thing together. Pretty much. The right. thing spins off its axis without you know, like these incredibly strong women. Yeah. yeah. And so that happened organically. Had I tried to impose that, it wouldn't have worked, right? Mm-hmm. So it was reminding John that, yes, we want that demographic, but we have to find it organically, right? I can't try to create characters to tap into a demographic. No, the minute you do that, you're dead. You're dead. And that's that's at odds with the whole, your whole deal is yeah. like being, you know, unapologetically as honest and, and, and as sort of, you know, fearless and courageous as mm-hmm. you possibly can be. Right. And the minute you step outside of that and start looking at, you know, trying to analyze it, mm-hmm. you're, you're doomed. Right. But it's got to be hard to preserve that. Yes. Yeah, and not, or not lean on it, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and and I was so aware of that, and uh, you know, and we had a lovely actress, and and it had nothing to do with her performance, and but uh, you know, so ultimately that character got extracted, and it really became this dynamic between a father and two sons. Um, Eddie James almost is the dad, right? Mm-hmm. So we have, you know, it's a great cast, and and uh, 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 so we, you know, and then. The so, inverse of sons, though. Yeah, a little bit. You have yeah. the son and the two dads, or the ghost of a dad and the yeah. stepdad. Uh, uh, so, but you know, but as I write this second episode, you know, already there are these organic avenues to these strong female characters, right? Mm-hmm. Without, but now they're happening organically because you know they're coming out of story and they're coming out of character and it's not me trying to impose the matriarch character, right? It goes back to that thing you said earlier about trying to be flexible and and allow it to tell you where it wants to go. Yeah. Right. And it's, and you know, it's, you know, much to the chagrin sometimes of my writers and, uh, you know, in terms of breaking story and creating beats and, you know, that'll, it'll change a lot when I do my draft, but, you know, the magic for me, uh, and this will sound sort of psychotic, but uh, and as if nothing else I've said tonight sounds psychotic. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, like for me, the magic happens when I'm in those scenes, right? And I hear the characters, right? And, I, and I, I'm engaged listening to them talk to each other and taking them on this emotional journey and, and, then, uh, and then looking at it and, then, you know, and, and go, oh, that's, you know, that – that character is this, right? That's how she responded based on, you know, the backstory we've created and the things that have happened. That's the organic response to that. So, you know, you start to see these characters that, you know, they always start out two-dimensional, right? They have to, right? So you start to see, oh, that's an interesting layer, right? That's an interesting layer. Mm -hmm. Um, I always use uh, this as, as an example, um, uh, that, uh, and this is, <laughs> this is really ballsy, but I was like a staff writer on, uh, on, uh, uh, the shield. And it was my episode and Sean was great. We would always be on set with our episode and 
we had an actress who it was, you know, that show sort of aired in post 9-11, right? So we have an actress and in my script, it, you know, she opens, she's, they're doing a surveillance, you know, they're looking for somebody and uh, they're knocking a door and it's a, uh, uh, um, it's an Egyptian guy. So the character uh, who was a cop, you know, she had this really, in the script, it was like a really strong reaction, right? And the actress who was, you know, you know, really smart and civil-minded and, you know, uh, I think her husband was an ACLU lawyer. Like she had this very open, you know, uh, political agenda. And she's like, well, she's, and I remember her coming up to me going, Danny would never do that. And I just looked at her and I went, but she does. And, and then just that beat for an actor to go, oh, I have to make that adjustment that mm. I have to adjust my backstory and, you know, and then approach it. Uh, suddenly I'm approaching this character from a whole different way. Mm. And it's really difficult sometimes for actors. Uh, I remember having a conversation with uh, John Hurt at one of the upfront things when he was doing damages uh, it wasn't really a conversation. I was listening to John. <laughs> John, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, Bill Hurt. I was listening to I'm William sorry. Hurt, who was on Damages. And he was a fascinating guy. And he was talking about the process of TV and how it was so difficult for him. Because he's used to getting a script and looking at the arc of a character mm. and beginning, middle, and end, and the growth of the character and, and knowing what all the choices were. So that he would start... And then all of a sudden he would get a script that flew in the face of Go choices he had made. Of, right. And it was really difficult for him until he embraced it in terms of like being to make those choices on the fly. Like, oh, he's a guy who does, does that. Mm -hmm. So then – and it's not like it makes anything else he's done bullshit. It's just another layer, right? Mm -hmm. And it had to mm -hmm. shift his whole perspective of, of how he worked and how he, he embraced it. And the good actors – really are able to do that if you if you lock into really sedentary points of view about a character and think that the character is one way or the character can't continue to grow through the arc of a season or a series mm -hmm. you know you're fucked mm -hmm. um so uh that was a bit of a rant i don't know no, it's cool but, but it but it, as long as it doesn't like you set up this world and so much of kind of what you do is setting a tone like there's like there's a very specific tone to the shows that you do like i'm yeah, I don't know how you conceptualize that on episode one. So everyone's on the same page. That's got to be challenging. Um, and then there are certain rules like to the universe. Like what is the code? Like, you know, your shows are about, you know, a very specific like sort of code of honor, mm -hmm. it seems like, you know, and that may not be, you know, a normal person's code. But in that universe, it makes perfect sense. Right, and all right. those characters have to like understand those rules and like behave accordingly. Right, right. Right. And it's family and it's, you know, whatever it gets crazy in this outlaw world. But, um, what I wanted to get at more is, is how did that work with like Charlie Hunnam? Cause it seems like you had almost like a partnership with him. Yeah. As you guys made this program. You know, you have to, I think, you know, ultimately, um, you know, what I realized is yes, I have to have the vision, right. I have to stay, steer the ship. Um, but, uh, you know, you have to empower your actors. You have to empower your directors. Um, and ultimately, it was Charlie and I on this journey. And, uh, you know, so, and Charlie was very, you know, you know, there was very few times when Charlie felt I was taking the character in a direction uh, he didn't agree with. Most of the time it was, you know, figuring out the best way to get there, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and he really, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, Charlie trusted me, you know, um, and ultimately that becomes, you know, an important component for a creator and a, and a, and a star is that there has to be a level of, you know, trusting, I'm going to trust your interpretation of who this guy is mm -hmm. and you're going to trust, you know, the journey that I'm taking him on. And not that you're not going to bump heads, not that you're not going to have different points of view, but that ultimately you trust each other's talent enough to, you know, to take it to where it's supposed to go, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. So Mayans comes, comes out, when is that premiering in the spring? Um, we don't know yet. They're still, you know, they're still negotiating. Uh, I'm hoping that we can you know, uh, I'm hoping we can fall into the old uh, uh, 
sun's time slot maybe and uh and uh and maybe end of summer early fall but they're still it's still all up in the air right now uh we we start shooting um mid april yeah. you know and uh we're a couple scripts deep right now and uh uh you know we're in the we're in the throes of it you it's know it's exciting man it is exciting it's yeah. terrifying a little bit um it's one of those things where you know uh Bastard was a blast, and and I'm you know I'm bummed it only it only you know lived for a, for one season, but it's been about you know it's been a little over two years since I've been you know I've been writing the whole time, and mm-hmm. uh, but I've been in it's been a while since I've been in this production rhythm, and you're like how do I do this? <laughs> you know, how does this work? And then you, then would happen. Yeah, but you're the guy who like can't sit still. You hate it when you're not working. I so know. come on, man. But, it, but ultimately what happens is you have no choice. Like you can't, I'm like, I don't, what is this? And then all of a sudden it's sort of like, in fact, I'm, I was supposed to go to New York uh, this week and go to, they have, the network has their little upfront, upfront thing. And, uh, um, but I'm already behind on scripts, yeah, yeah. and it's you know, and it's sort of like that's what happens. You're like, oh, that's how I do it. Right. I fucking lock myself in a room uh-huh. and I give notes and I write. You know what I mean? It's uh-huh. like you just you 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 know, there's a certain amount of wiggle room where you can go, what is this? Until it's like all on top of you, and you go, oh, <laughs> sink or swim. Just yeah. focus and you like get it done. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, man, we've been going for a while. I want to be mindful of your time and let yes. you go. Uh, but let me just, there's one more thing I wanted to ask you about, which is like how you make it work as a husband and as a father. You know, it's like you're collaborating with your wife. That has to be super intense mm-hmm. and challenging. You know, as somebody who <laughs> collaborates from time to time with my own wife, right, right, right. that blurring of the lines between, you know, personal time and professional time. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, making sure that you're, you're balanced out enough so that you can be, you know, the dad that you want to be. Yeah. No, that's a, that's, that's a great question. Um, and, uh, you know, here's what I, generally I, I, I fuck it up all the time and it's really imperfect. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, both of us live this, uh, uh, are on this path that sort of forces us to, you know, look at our shit, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I'm always sort of, uh, you know, swinging wide and then, you know, bouncing off a wall and then coming back and, and recentering and going, oh, that's who I am. That's what I'm supposed to do, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, Katie and I had bumps early on in uh, on Sons. Uh, and then, you know, we got into a rhythm and she became very respectful of, you know, m- you know, and was able to separate, you know, uh, some things and, uh um, uh, and then, uh, you know, and it's interesting now not working together because we did it for so long. We did it for, you know, with Bastard in, in yeah. the UK and, and, uh, you know, and now she's doing uh, her sitcom and, and, you know, so it's interesting having separate lives again, but in a, in a good way, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, but balance, you know, the balance is, it's hard, man. Yeah. It's like doing, um, you know, trying to stay in that pocket of, uh, uh, of positivity and, uh, and being mindful, uh, is always a challenge, especially for, you know, and I think I can sort of throw you into the workaholic category, Mm -hmm. you know, where we, it's, we love what we do and it can become all consuming Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, I always, you know, I have this amazing, uh, you know, uh, uh, 11-year-old at home who who just constantly forces me to recenter. Mm-hmm. She doesn't let me, she doesn't let me swing out too far. Yeah. She rattles my cage and say, pay attention, you know, and, uh, you know, in a very Kurt-like fashion, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? The mirror is up. My oh, friend. man, yeah. it, it is so up. And, uh, uh, but she, you know, uh, uh, she is definitely my, my mirror and, uh, uh, you know, it just, uh, uh, it's been a game changer in every area of my life. Good, bad, crazy, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, uh, and beautiful, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and, uh, she's usually the thing that, you know, causes me to, you know, fall off the beam. And then she's usually the thing that puts me right back in the middle, you know? Um, but, 
you know, balance is a, is a, is a struggle. Uh, you know, I have tools that when I choose to employ them, give me some, you know, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I have to usually get really uncomfortable before uh, I uh, I employ some of those tools. Yeah, you, you know what I mean? Both, man. You know, and uh, it's, but I, a, it's uh, interesting that you guys are both. I mean, you and Katie are both. You know, artists that are you know so in your creative vein. You know, it's like Katie's amazing. She's an incredible musician. She can mm-hmm. do comedy. She just, you know what she did on Sons was uh, just mind blowing. Like her range is extraordinary yeah. right like she's just so prolific in her output and then you have you you know who has a vi- like a very strong conviction about the visions that you're trying to manifest and you know normally it would be you know one one person in the relationship is is that kind of creative person and the other person is more of like the grounded anchor right right you know? yeah no it's really um you know in terms of professionally it's really uh um you know, I think we're uh, equally uh, respectful and in awe of what each other do. So uh, there's a lot of respect for that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think there's ever, you know, because we're of what we do and how we do it. Uh, and both, you know, and obviously recovery and, and, and this other path, this higher minded path we're both on, you know, contribute to that. But we... You know, we're very aware of um, uh, the, you know, the of the respect that we have for each other, and uh, uh, and it's usually, you know, there's very few professional hurdles. You know, uh, you know, family stuff and personal stuff always is 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 the nature of it, but. Uh, there's always, you know, professionally, we've always sort of been very lucky in that, you know, even what she's doing now and, and uh, Superior Donuts and, you know, uh, she, you know, I think she joneses sometimes for Gemma and, uh, but, uh, you know, but she loves what she does and she does a really good job and she elevates the quality of, of, of the work tremendously. And, uh, 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 and, and, you know, uh, I can look at, things, uh, you know, that whole other medium, uh, with a whole different, you know, through different glasses that allow me to have this same amount of respect for what she's mm-hmm. doing there as she, as she did on sons, you know, and I think that goes both ways, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's cool. You know? Yeah. I think you have that too, man. You know? Yeah. I mean, it can be, it can be prickly at times. Like the, 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 the journey has been to, come to that place of like respect and admiration yeah. and not like trying to ply my version of what I think that person should be doing on, you know, it's like, yes. like, Oh, she's got her thing. And like, she's fucking good at it. Right. Man. And like, it doesn't need, like I can stand back now and just like, like respect it and revere it right. without having to get too involved in it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that space. Like, and, and the same thing, like she can give me the space to. Right. And it's, and that's easier said than done. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that is, you know, uh, you know, for fear based people, uh, and I speak for myself, you know, (laughs) that, that. (laughs) you know, it's hard, it's hard to trust that. Right. And, uh, um, but I think, you know, look, I think time and, and, uh, time can remedy some of that, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, uh, and, uh, you know. We, 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 we trust a little bit more mm-hmm. and, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it really comes down to, uh, uh, having that, uh, you know, having that trust and, and knowing that, you know, uh, no matter what happens that it's all going to be okay yeah. in terms of success mm-hmm. and what show gets picked up, what doesn't happen, who gets the job, who doesn't, you know, that ultimately, you know, that's all, you know, those are all gifts, you know, and, uh, and you, you know, you take them, uh, when they come and, and, uh, and sort of be grateful for whatever they look like, you know? Yeah. But the, the dynamic of your relationship cannot be defined by those things. No. Or you're screwed. No, that's, that's yeah. correct. That's correct. But I think it's, um, it's learning, you know, how to do that. Yeah. That enables, uh, you know, because that can be, you know, that can add, those external threats can, you know, can rip a marriage in half, right? Right. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
But I think it's, you know, I think it's having the ability to know ultimately that uh, we're all going to be okay. <laughs> you know I, I mean? hope so, man. Are we? Are we going to be all right? We're going to be all right. All right, man. Good. All right. Final thing. Um, if somebody's listening to this and they are, uh, they have a creative spark, but they're frustrated or they feel stuck or they, they, they don't feel like they really understand how to express themselves, whether it's on the written page or in music or, or in film, like, what do you, I'm sure you speak to young creative types, you know, filmmakers, writers and the like, like, what is your piece of wisdom? My piece of advice? wisdom? Hmm. Um, uh, you know, it's easy to say this, but I, my experience is that, uh, um, uh, you know, one really has to remove the editor from that process. You know, I think so many writers and speaking to writing specifically, you know, people are, you know, so worried about doing something that's going to sell or something that people want to hear, you know, so there's, there's this need to like generate something that's going to be successful mm -hmm. rather than generating something that means something, you know? And, uh, and once, and when you, when you adjust that process to create something that with a specific result in mind, you're fucked. Right. So you write about things that move you. Uh, you write about things that, you know, whether that, whether being moved means, you know, being enraged, means being, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, in love, you know, whatever that is, you have to write f uh, about something and from a place of, I need to tell this story rather than I'm going to write this to get this. Mm -hmm. And I would say 98.7% of the people that generate scripts and stuff in this town are doing the latter. They're writing something, you know, for an end result of this. And not that it doesn't work for them, but creatively, you know, uh, you're, you know, then you're, you know, you're, you're just, uh, um, you know, uh, a two dimensional machine. Yeah. It's right? funny. It's funny that that's the case when at the same time we all kind of understand like, Oh, we, there's a dearth of, of really unique, compelling voices. Like who's the next voice, who has the voice we, that's what they're looking for. Right. They're looking for somebody who has conviction, right. who has a point of view, who feels strongly about something. Right. And, and when that, when that is expressed honestly and with skill, that rises to the top. Right. I always tell writers when they say, you know, I'm trying to write this, you know, or, um, you know, I want to write a script about this, right? And I say, well, why are you writing a script about this? And they'll more often than not, well, it'll go back to a specific project, right? And I said, now, do you think somebody, you know, said write about that? You know, I said, no, that became the thing everyone wanted to recreate because it was what it was. Mm -hmm. And it's your job to figure out, you know, what means, you know, rather than, you know, starting uh, with the, the end result, you start from, you know, within and then, you know, be that thing that everybody else wants to recreate, yeah, yeah. you know. And it's hard for writers to wrap their brain around that sometimes, you know. And uh, that's why I'd much rather take – a writer who is green in terms of process and, and, uh, uh, and, um, you know, technique, but who clearly has an interesting point of view, you know, cause that's, that's the gold, right? The rest is just any hack can learn a three act format. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and there's a lot of talented people out there, but, uh, you know, even some of those talented people get, fall trap to what do I need to create to get the job? Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and then you're fucked, yeah. you know? And ultimately the super awesome job they want will happen when they are able to get to that place. Absolutely. Of expression. Absolutely. Cause and anything else they get in the interim is all going to go away anyhow. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Cause it's not real or it's not based on anything that they truly are inspired to do. You know, yeah. I think. Cool. All right, man. Thanks hey, for doing that. Thanks, dude. brother. You feel all right? I'm good, man. You're I'm good. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tired out? No, uh, I'm glad we finally got to a chance to do this, man. Yeah, uh, I appreciate it, man. You've you've uh, 
you have been um, a source of inspiration in my own life and you've been there for me as a friend and I appreciate you as a human being and I appreciate the work that, that you do. So it was a pleasure and an honor to um, ditto, hear man. a little bit more about it. Ditto and, and uh, tremendous respect for you and, and, and your journey and especially these last, you know, 15, 20 years is really, I tell people about you all the time yeah, cool. and, uh, uh, and tremendous respect for, uh, for what you do. And, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, as I, you know, half-heartedly try to mirror you. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know about that, man. <laughs> don't do that. I think you're doing all right. All right, buddy. Thank you. Um, cool. Awesome. Uh, at Sutter Inc. is how you track this man down. Hit him up. Let him know what you thought of our talk. But uh, don't bug him. <laughs> all right, dude. Thanks, brother. Don't piss him off. Much love. Thanks, brother. <laughs> We'll